Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you as the presenter of the third panel of the conference entitled Russian Imperialism, Literature and Culture, and introduce our guests. Um, on my left hand is Galina Kazimirovskaya from Belarus. On my right hand, Boris Shumiansky and Zhuzha Henteni. My name is Stanislav Škoda and I work at the Institute for the Study of Totalitarian Regimes in Prague. Uh, we will start with Mrs. Galina uh, Kazimirovskaya, a Belarusian opposition activist and music teacher, conductor of Volny Kerr, which became a symbol of resistance against the Lukashenko regime in 2020. Just a few words about her work. Volnikor emerged from the release arranged by the musicians of the Belarusian State Philharmonic in August 2020. Almost instantly, they were joined by the members of the other means collectives and also by common people that just wanted to sing. Volnikor arranged flash mobs at the largest shopping malls, in the metro, at the railway station, and at the food market Kamarovka. Both professionals and amateurs were united by one common desire to stop the violence and to establish a democracy. So I will pass the word to, to Galina. Galina, please. Uh, Galina's intervention is entitled The Russian World in Belarus the suppression of the integrity of the nation and its cultural heritage and the possibility of its healthy, nationally oriented development. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here. Good afternoon. I continue my speech and I will speak in Russian. 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 Мой сегодняшний выступ, и он будет довольно особистый. Это моя персональная история. Тема моего сегодняшнего выступления – русский свет белорусского. Утлачивание народа, себеидентификация. Русский свет белорусского. Утлачивание. Можности здравого народа. Russian world in Belarus. Я народилась в Беларуси, когда я наш выходила из склада Советского Союза, который распался, когда я была детем. Росла на переломе часов, и в неком, в неком сенсе я так само охвяра уплыву русского света, который укоренялся повсюль в моей стране. I was born in Belarus when Belarus was part of the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union was broken, I was a child. I grew up on the edge of the epoch, and in some measure, I was a victim of the influence of the Russian world, which was pushed into my country everywhere. I have a Russian mother and a father of Russian descent. I was raised in the context of the Russian culture and the Russian history. Маці писала визволення до вивчення білоруської мови у школі. На жаль, у нас так можна було. Мняла сам русську маменку, русського татінка, жидовського поводу. Била сам віховавана темняш мимо контекст білоруської історії а білоруської культури. Моя маменка писала жадост, аби мене уволнили з годин білоруштини. Богужел, білоруську то було можне. Дома велика бібліотека з повним збором творів Достоєвського, Толстого, Чехова, яких нельга не прочитати. Розмови про мамін родний Ленінград, про Москву, яка є ліщиці нашій. Дома ми мали велику книговну, а була там велика збірка діл Достоєвського, Толстого, Чехова. Не було можна си її не прочитати. Мовили ми про Ленінград, відкуд походила маменка, про Москву, яка була наша. Дома я вовголі не чула білоруської мови. У сім'ї культивувалися руська культура, руська історія, як історія саме великої країни у світі. Дома я не слышала білорусчину. В родині була респектована руська література, руська класична гурба, руська історія, яку історія не вічі за мене в світі. А білоруська мова лічилася вязковою мовою, скажоною руською мовою. Білоруський язик се поважував за так званий весницький язик з кресленою верзією руштини. 
Під час моєго професійного навчання у середніх вищих музичних едукаціях гити русський світ він притягувався. Ми вчилися на прикладах русської музики і історії, видавалися на артикулах русської критики, вчилися на операх Глінки, Римського, Корсаха, Чайковського. Během mých profesních studií na středních vzdělávacích zařízeních, vysokých vzdělávacích zařízeních, ten ruský svět pokračoval. My jsme se učili z příkladů ruské hudby a historie. Vyrůstali jsme na článcích ruských kritiků. Učili jsme se opery od Glinky, Rymského, Korsakova, Čajkovského. У процентных отношениях для русской музыки было разы в три меньше. У консерватории у нас был особенный предмет замежной музычной литературы и русской музычной литературы. И она как бы своя, не замежная. И мне сдается, у нас и до этого так засталось. В процентах белорусской гудбы мы имели трикрат меньше. На высокой школе která se v Bělorusku říká konzervatoř, pokud se bavíme o hudobní vysoké škole. Jsme měli samostatný předmět, zahraniční hudební literatura a ruská hudební literatura. Ta ruská hudební literatura byla jakoby svoje, nikoliv zahraniční, nikoliv cizí. A myslím si, že to funguje stejně doteď. Доминирование и вытеснение белорусской культуры отбывалось у Беларуси на протяжении 20 х столетий, отбывается и сегодня. На жаль, тот механизм, который был запущен коммунистами, выдатно работал. Телебачение, радио, подручники в школе, символика, шильды, пропаганда, киноиндустрия, театры – все работало, как в наших головах, в наших сердцах, в нашей сведомости укоренился русский свет. Převládení a odsouvení běloruské kultury probíhalo v Bělorusku během 20. století. Probíhá i teď. Bohužel ten mechanismus, který byl spuštěn komunisty, výborně funguje stále. Televize, rozhlas, učebnice ve školách, symbolika, cedule, propaganda, kinematografie, divadla, všechno fungovalo proto, aby pouštělo kouřeny ruského světa do našich hlav, do našich srdcí, do našeho vědomí. Rozmavlívat na vůlicech po rusku bylo naturálně. Rozmavlívat po bělorusku divně. Lidé prostě počínali ohledovat. Mluvit venku rusky bylo něco přirozeného. Mluvit bělorusky bylo zvláštní. Lidi se na tebe začínali nějak zvláštně dívat. Ale pro lidé mého pokolení to nebylo něčím štučným. To být sobě tak, tolik je potřebné být. To vše zachodilo jak rodné, bez bačného supracívu. Pro lidi mé generace to nebylo něco umělého, bylo to jako přirozené a nevyvolávalo žádný odpor. Конечно, весь час белорусская культура иснувала и развивалась. Она друковалась невеликими накладами и сбирала невеликие зали. И, дякуючи как раз выдатным представникам белорусского мастерства, которые пронесли ее праз репрессии, праз обыяковость, праз немодность, она заховалась, она не зникла. Нагледя на то, белорусская культура экзистовала и развивала се. Была тищена невелкими наклады, сволавала Sály, prorážela si cestu a díky vynikajícím zástupcům běloruského umění, kteří to umění pronesli přes represe, lhostejnost, modní trendy, se ta kultura, to umění zachovaly, nezmizely. Můj šlák do Bělorusy, já počala už o své domu muzrosti. Sustřela svého budoucího muže, běloruské kompozitory Barda. I dle mě, dle sebe odkryla nový svět. Белорусские поэты, музыки, литераторы, мастаки, оказывается, есть целую супольность, у которых говорят по белорусскому, ведают свою историю, шануют и любят белорусскую культуру. Моя цеста до Белоруска начала в уведомленном веку. Подкала сам своего будущего манжела, белорусского складателя и барда. А к моему прикваплению сам си объявила новый свет. Bělorusští básnici, bělorusští hudebníci, literáti, umělci, existují celé, celá společenství, komunity, kde se mluví jenom bělorusky, kde lidi vědí svoje dějiny, respektují je a mají rádi běloruskou kulturu. Já počala popomňat pro bělou svojím nevůdství, nevědění. Strašně bylo dovědět se s časem, jak znišťali bělorusku kulturu, její představníků na pracáhu 20. stahodě. Fyzičně znišťali. Dovědět se pro černý spisy dějičního mastáctva, jaký jistnují do této pory. Bělorus přežila několik chvalí v represi i zprob z srdce vše běloruské. I tady velmi skladaný historický šlach podavlení nácii, nejtolky sovětskými vládami, ale například polskými. 
Začala jsem si doplňovat mezery ve své nevzdělanosti a neznalosti. Hrozným bylo se dozvědět postupně, jak ničili běloruskou kulturu a její zástupce během 20. století fyzicky ničili. Dozvědět se o tom, že existovaly černé listiny umělců a lidí od kultury. A takové seznamy existují v Bělorusku dodnes. Bělorusko zažilo řadu vln represí a pokusu vygumovat všechno běloruské a je tu velmi náročná historická doba a cesta potlačování v podstatě národa. A to nejen sovětskou moci, ale v řadě případů i polskou. Na pewno bezprecedentny wypadek u świecie, kiedy u noc 29 na 30 kastrycznik 1937 roku u Mięsku odbyła się akcja, analogu jakiej nie wiedzie historii człowieczeństwa. Na pracach jednej nocy stalinskim zagadem byli rozstrzelani bolsz za 130 dziejczu mostactwa, kultury, nauki. U liku rozstrzelani było 22 poety. Asi je to bezprecedentní případ pro svět v Bělorusku. Noc z 29. na 30. října roku 37 v Minsku proběhla razie, která ne, asi nemá analogy v dějinách lidstva. Během jedné noci na základě nařízení od Stalina bylo zastřeleno přes 130 zástupců představitelů kultury, umění a vědy. Mezi zastřelenými bylo 22 běloruských bás. Вот с таким, вот с так одним махом забить лепших в сердце, задушить белорусское слово, белорусскую думку. Забойства белорусской интеллигенции будут протягиваться, на жаль, и в 1938-1939 и позднее. А еще будут выселки у Сибир, у лагеры. Сотни людей, у тем лику представников белорусской культуры, которые опынутся в вымышленной эмиграции. Спочатку в немецких лагерах для перемещенных особу, а после раскиданные по всему свете. Během jedné noci zavraždili ty nejlepší, vygumovali je, chtěli uh, udusit běloruské slovo, běloruskou myšlenku. Vraždy uh, páchané na běloruských intelektuálech budou pokračovat i v roce 1938, i v roce 1939, i později. A k tomu ještě nucené přestěhování na sebeř, do táboru. Uh, stovky lidí, uh, včetně zástupců běloruské kultury, se ocitli v nucené emigraci. Nejdříve v německých táborech pro přesunuté osoby později byly přesunuty po celém světě. Povod různých padlíků na pracích od druhé světové války na západ vyjíhlo kolem 100 tisíc Bělorusů. I sérot jich byl plný odsotek dějící běloruské kultury. Podle různých statistik během druhé světové války na západ migrovalo spousta, spousta lidí. Jedná se o stovky tisíc Bělorusů, mimo jiné. Mezi nimi byly zástupci běloruské kultury, spisovatele, skladatele, umělci, herci. Emigrace byla vymušená, ona byla politická po své soutnosti. Její udělníky nežadali znovu žít při sovětské vládě. Na západě vystupali jako vyrazné antikomunisty, ale za mezi nimi bolší z nich pracovali zajímat se běloruským pytáním, prasování běloruské kultury. I to tak samý velizárný kavalek práce u zprávy zachování běloruské kultury, její vplyv, jaká vplyvala i vplyvá zaraz na sionu, na tu běloruskost, jaká je uvnitř krajiny. Emigrace byla nucená ale podle své podstaty byla politického rázu. Jelikož ti, kteří emigrovali, nechtěli žít za sovětské moci a na západě vystupovali proti komunismu. V zahraničí většina z nich pokračovala v běloruské problematice, snažili se propagovat běloruskou kulturu. A je to velký díl práce, co se týká zachování běloruské kultury. A ten jejich díl práce má vliv i na to, že dokážeme udržovat tu běloruskost dnes uvnitř země. У 2020 году я стала свидетелем исторического феномена – национального обучения и отражения нации. Я сейчас не хочу разважать, что правильно мы все сделали в 2020 году, что мы проиграли и сгубили страну. V roce 2020 jsem byla svědkem historického fenoménu, národního probouzení, obrození běloruského národa. Já nyní dnes nechci se pouštět do diskuze, jestli jsme všechno, co jsme udělali, udělali správně, jestli jsme uspěli nebo prohráli, jestli jsme ztratili zemi. 
Але я хочу розказатися об тисячах людей, які перейшли на білоруську мову, взяли зі білоруські книги, заспівали білоруські пісні. Я бачила на власні очі, як нарешті нація зрозуміла, ким я найось, і повернулася тварем до білоруськості. Chci dnes mluvit o tisícech lidí, kteří začali mluvit bělorusky po roce 2020. Pustili se do čtení běloruských knih, začali zpívat běloruské písně. Viděla jsem, jak se národ probudil, jak pochopil, co je zač a obrátil se tvářem k běloruské kultuře. To je, co odbylo se s takovou velikou kolikostí lidí i vůbec z nácí fenomeny prorým, jaký už nikudy nedějnice. To, co se odehrálo s tak velkým počtem lidí a obecně s ruským národem, je to fenomen, je to přelom, který již nikam nezmizí. I jak kalisti, já sama odšukala u sebe běloruskou osobu, odšukala svoju, svoju běloruskou, simknula rozkopovat svakou sebe je. Je tak sama odbylo se znáci. Stejně tak, jako kdysi já jsem si našla tu cestu k běloruské kultuře, našla jsem si v sobě bělorusku a takovým způsobem se to odehrálo i v tom roce 2020 s celým národem. I samé hlavné, že běloruské odhukalo se u lidí. Smaha do, běloruské, do běloruského slova, historie, kultury rostla i povelíčovala se. Zdaje se, odkud ljubov do věršov, na jakých my nerostli, odkud ljubov do pěsí, na jakých my nečuli raněji, to, že jiné národy berou z malého matě, my povinni byli šukat, zdobovat, zmahat se za právo mít Bělorus. A na, nejdůležitější na tom je, že ta běloruská kultura um, přinášela radost lidem. A lidi začali cítit hlad po běloruském slovu, po běloruské historii, kultuře. A ta kultura rostla, a množila se. Zdá se, odkud se bere láska k básním, na kterých jsme nevyrůstali? Odkud se bere láska k písním, které jsme dřív neslyšeli? To, co jiné národy si berou s mlékem od maminky, my jsme museli najít dosáhnout toho a museli jsme bojovat za samotné právo mít běloruskou kulturu a bělorusko. Tak stalo se, že už nyní 2020. roku já stojala na stvorení volného chora, dirižorem a kyrůnikom, já zjevlám se, jakého do této pary. Volný chor je to unikální kulturnické zjava, politický muzický ruch, jaký zjevil se počas protestu v Bělorusi v 2020. roku a v nějakém sensu stal symbolem revoluce pro milionů lidí. Stalo se to, že v srpnu 2020 jsem byla u zrození takzvaného volného pěveckého sboru, volný chor. Byla jsem dirigentkou a vedoucí a jsem jí doteď. Volný chor, volný pěvecký sbor je unikátní kulturní jev, politicky hudební hnutí, které vzniklo během protestů v Bělorusku a stalo se z něj symbol revoluce pro miliony Bělorusů. Хор співає найбільш знакові білоруські пісні і гімни, ладить флешмоби на вулицях і громадських містах, з'являється ніадколі і зникає нікуди повсюль. Нічого подобного ще не було в Білорусі, махчима і у світі. Гэта хор з народу, гэта голос народу. Jevecký sbor Volný chor zpívá nejdůležitější, nejsymboličtější, nejcharakteričtější běloruské písně, hymny. Pořádá blesková akce v ulicích, v veřejném prostoru. Vzniká od někud a pak mizí nikam. Nic podobného v Bělorusku dřív nebylo a možná i ani ve světě. Je to sbor z národa a je to hlas národa. Слухаючи нас, люди підхоплювали пісню, співали разом, разом з нами. Поступово наш рух розвивався, ми створили нотні зборники, ми записували альбоми білоруських пісень, розладили шерих концертів у дворах Менска, на яких не тільки виконували пісні, але й розвучували співати гэтай пісні жихарами гэтих дворів, розповідали про автора гэтих пісень. Když lidi poslouchali naše písně, začínali zpívat spolu s námi. Postupně se to hnutí rozvíjelo. My jsme vytvořili notové listy, notové sbírky běloruských písní. Nahráli jsme Alba. Uspořádali jsme řadu koncertů ve dvorcích v Minsku. Tam se zpívali nejen písně, ale i lidi se učili zpívat. Připojovali se k nám obyvatele těchto dvorků. Vyprávěli jsme o 
a autorech těchto písní. Mnozí z nich byli zastřelení ve 30. letech minulého století anebo deportování ze země. Ještě nikdy zborové umění nedosahovalo takové úrovně. Люди повсюду начали спевать, учить песни. Усюду чекали появления хору. Песня давала людям силы, давала надежду, поддерживала, объединяла народ. Люди начали спевать, начали се учить песни. Всюду чекали на тен наш певецкий сбор песен, давала людям силу, подпоровала их, споювала, давала до громады. Цікава річ. На початку з'явлення вольного хору нам не було, не було чого співати. Ми амаль не віддали своїх пісень. Міновіто тоді я довідалася, скільки музики було знищено, сховано від білоруського народу. Zajímavost. Na začátku vzniku volného pěveckého sboru jsme neměli co zpívat, protože jsme nevěděli ty svoje písně. Právě tehdy jsem se dozvěděla, kolik hudby bylo zničeno, kolik hudby bylo schováno před běloruským národem. Já otrmala vyšejší muzičnou edukaci. Já kazala se, že nevěduji desítky prozvěšů běloruských autorů, sotních tvorů. Za to já mohu rozpovědět pro muzičné rysy osnovných herojů Ivana Susanina Glinky i na paměť, na paměť zpívají polifoničné tvory Tanejů. Je taky žánr chrvají písně, zvyčajně je na mají patriotický charakter, je na, napisána pro lůbou, do rodzimy, pro přichodu svého kraju. V každé krajině je taky písně, hymny, které vědují a zpívají z dětinstva. Jich představují to svůj kraj. Měnovitě pro taky písně formují se jedna cenace. Ačkoliv jsem získala hudební vzdělání vysokoškolské, zjistila jsem, že nevím desítky příjmení běloruských autorů, stovky děl od běloruských autorů, ale za to můžu vyprávět o hudebních charakteristikách základních hrdinů Ivana Susanina od Glinky. Na spaměť dokážu zaspívat polifonické díla od Tanejeva. Existuje takový žánr, Zborová píseň. V podstatě se většinou jedná o vlastenecké písně, kde se vychvaluje láska k vlasti a krásy rodné země. Každá země má takové zborové písně, byly hymny. Všichni je umí, všichni je zpívají od malička a se vychvalují ten svůj kraj, tu svou zem. Právě díky takovým písním se formuje a dává se dohromady národ. A malý vodní takové běloruské písně my nevěděli. Já není děň hučali, těch not nebylo v bibliotekách. Šmat materiálu bylo zničeno. Šmat stvárali se u migrace i nedochodilo do nás. Bylo zabaroněno, vykresleno. Отрималося, что у нас крали целый жанр музыки. Весь час кто-то отмыслово заминал нам быть нацией. V podstatě skoro žádnou takovou běloruskou píseň jsme neuměli, protože nikdy nikde nezněly. Nebyly noty v knihovnách. Spousta materiálů bylo zničeno. Něco je v emigraci, ale částečně zmizelo v té emigraci a nedostávalo se do nás, k nám do Běloruska. Případně bylo zakázáno, vyřazeno. Ukradly nám žánry hudební. Только за один месяц мы отшукали десятки таких песен и вернули их в музычную простору. Для меня это был сопрадный суд, потому что за месяц деятельности вольного хора к этой песне, которую мы спевали на улицах Менска, они разлетелись по всей Украине. Как бы кто-то нам прикажал, чтобы мы были народом. No a my během jednoho měsíce jsme se snažili dohledat ty zapomenuté písně. Ve dne a v noci jsem dělala různé variace pro náš pěvecký sbor. Sestavovala se noty, abychom co nejrychleji s zástupci volného sboru jsme se to naučili. Pro mě byl to opravdový zázrak. Během měsíce činností, fungování volného pěveckého sboru jsme zpívali desítky písní v ulicích Minsku a ty písně začaly být známé po celé zemi. Zdají se prostě písně. Ale ne prostě. Pro texty i sensy my lépe rozuměli historii svého národa, usvědomili svou přináležnost do jeho, odčuvali sobě jedinou nací, osobní nací i nareště odčuli honor nesti u sobě Bělorus. My zmohli probít se přes ruský svět i vytěhnout svojo. 
zdá se jenom písně, obyčejné písně, ale přes texty, přes smysly, které jsou v nich obsaženi, jsme si lip uvědomili dějiny vlastního národa, uvědomili jsme si svoji příslušnost, začali jsme se cítit jako národ, samostatný národ a konečně jsme pocítili hrdost za to, že neseme v sobě Bělorusko. Dokázali jsme si prorazit cestu přes ruský svět a vytáhnout na venek to svoje, to běloruské. Čím byl populárním i maštabným rybil si náš ruch, tím bolš nebezpečný byl udělujím. Nás stali odšukovat, sažat u turmy i vstělák přeskladžat naše dějnosti. Počas repetice na nás robili oblavy, za námi sačili i neodnorazovo nám počas našich výstupů nám dovodilo se prostě utíkat i chovat se do mapu. Čím populárnější a větším bylo naše hnutí, tím to bylo nebezpečnější pro nás se účastnit tohoto hnutí. Začali se nás vyhledávat, dávat do vězení, různými způsoby překážet v naší činnosti. Během zkoušek na nás pořádali, prováděli razie. Sledovali nás. Vícekrát během našich vystoupení jsme se museli schovávat před příslušníky silových složek OMON. Хор репетує подпольно, заховує свої, ховає свої твари і імени. У протизанських умовах ми записуємо кліпи і лазимо онлайн-концерти. Після одної гучної акції в оперному театрі режитували мене, після ще декілька хористів. Вогулі за 9 місяців діяльності вольного хору на Білорусі було арештовано коли 30 удільників хору, деяких по декілька разів. Пєвецький збор функує ілегальні, сховава свої твари і мене. Za partizánských podmínek nahráváme videa a pořádáme koncerty online. Po jedné větší akci u operního divadla zatkli i mě a také několik dalších účastníc, účastníků sboru. Během devíti měsíců fungování pěveckého sboru bylo začeno zhruba 30 jeho účastníků. Někteří, někteří byli začeni vícekrát. Были присуды, катавания и великие штрафы. На особных удельников хор заведены криминальные справы за террористическую деятельность, на котором из нас погрожают от 8 до 20 годов тюрьмы, когда мы вернемся на родину. Падли вироки, доказали к мучению, к бровским покутам. Некоторые участники певецкого сбора соутрестно стихани, а покут се врати до Белоруска, грозы им вязани 8 аж 20 лет. I jsou vnucené migraci. I znovu vymušené migraci, i znovu zproba zadušit jsou běloruské. Maštabu, pravda, takového ještě nebylo, ale ještě i my nepěrši u této historické kropci i zdávat se my nezbírajeme se. A zase vnucená migrace a zase pokus zničit všechno běloruské. Ale tak velké měřítko, jako v tom roce 2020, dřív nikdy nebylo. A nejsme první v tomto historickém bodě a nehodláme se vzdát. На сьогоднішній момент у Білорусі протягуються репресії у дочиненні у тим ліку до діючого білоруського мистецтва, їх переслід, знищення культурного осіроддя, винищення культурних з'яв у проєкту, вигнання діючої культури, заборона на білоруськомовну культурну діяльність, закриття шматліких білоруських організацій, ініціатив, звольняють білоруських діючого мистецтва. V dnešním Bělorusku probíhají represe mimo jiné vůči zástupcům činitelům kultury. Jsou pro následování, je ničeno kulturní prostředí, jsou ničeny kulturní jevy, projekty, dochází k nucené migraci umělců. Je zakazováno téměř všechno, co je spojeno s běloruskou kulturou. Dochází k zavírání četných běloruských organizací, iniciativ. 11 липня у білоруській турмі був забитий мастак Олесь Пушкін, який у 22-м році був осуджений на 5 років позбавлення волі у турмі узмоцненого режиму за здік з державних символів і розпалювання ворожості. Під час арешту Олеся на його вачах усі його праці були знищені дубінками АМАПа. І він помер у Гродненським шпиталі, куди був привезений в непритомному стані під конвоєм з турми. Smrt nastupila pro nějakazání medicinské dopomohy. 11. července v běloruském vězení byl zavražděn běloruský umělec Alice Puškin, který v roce 2022 byl odsouzen k pěti letům vězení. V věznici s přísnou ostrahou. 
A byl odsouzen a jeho díla byla zničena o bušky OMON. Během začení došlo samozřejmě i k zblácení Alese. Zemřel v nemocnici v Hrodně, kam byl převezen v bezvědomí s ozbrojeným doprovodem. Zemřel přes to, že mu nebylo poskytnuta včas zdravotní péče. V turmě znachodí se muzika Marie Kalesníkova, jakou je přesuděna 11 hodov po zbavlení voli v kolonii u kolonii s agulným režimem. Prostan je její zdraví. V ohli nějaké zvěstky ob její její rodné netrimovat už bolž za 7 měsíců. Ve vězení se nachází Marie Kalesníkova. Byla odsouzena k 11 letům vězení. Zase v věznici s speciálním režimem ostrahy. Ohledně jejího zdravotního stahu její příbuzní nic neví. Po dobu posledních sedmi měsíců. Několik dní tamu trom dělníkům běloruského hůrta Turben přesudili do devíti hodů uzmocněného režima i velizárné štrafy. Jany zpívali písně. Před několika dny zástupcům hudební kapely Torbent padly rozsudky devět let vězy. Jenom zpívali, jenom zpívali písně. Lukašankovský režim bojí se písen, bojí se toho efektu od písně, který je uzděničený běloruský národ. Lukašankovský vláda zpravují vymoc Bělorusk z Bělorusy, zničit paměť, přepisat krajinu. Lukašenkov režim se bojí písní. Bojí se toho efektu, které, který může mít píseň. Snaží se to vymítit, protože píseň může ovlivnit běloruský národ. Lukašenkova vláda se snaží vymítit všechno běloruské z Běloruska, zničit paměť a přepsat dějiny země. To robí se asensováno i agresivně. Například počas maršu v 2020 roce lidé, kteří mluvili běloruskou, označili markerem červený kříž na lbě. I tady jich byli bolš, jmenovitě za mnou. Dělají to uvědoměle a agresivně. Během pochodu protestních v roce 2020 mlátili více ty lidi, kteří mluvili bělorusky. Právě za ten jazyk. Na dopadu posledního komitetu Počas dopytu mi ještě zkazali, kvůli se mnou normálně. Během výslechu v vazební věznici u vyšetřovatele stále mi říkali, mluv, mluv se mnou normálně a říkali to rusky. Na pracovu svoji vládu Lukašenka odkynul Bělorusi na 10 hodin u Savok, u Lába Rosii, a dal nás zadarma. Сегодня у школьных подружников вырывают белорусские имены, переписывают историю, а дети на святах спевают Катюшу. В это силовой захоп краины, и он не будет рваться долго, не может. Бегом своей влады Лукашенко отгодил Белорусско десятки лет спадки до так званого совку, совку, это же та советская доба, до спару Руска, а отгодил нас там сдарма. V školních učebnicích nejsou běloruská jména, připisují dějiny. Děti o svácích nezpívají Kaťušu, což je ruská píseň. Je to silové zabrání země, ale nebude trvat dlouho. Nedokáže vydržet dlouho. Ale s dobrými znakami toho, že to nebude, jak raněji vzjemňuje se dle nás to, že u Bělorusy už taky rastí partizánský ruch. Běloruská kultura chodí se šla o podvaly, ale živě. Dobrým signálem je to, že se situace nevrátí do té předchozí. To, že existuje v Bělorusku tzv. partizánské hnutí. Běloruská kultura sice je v ilegalitě, ale běloruská kultura žije. Raní u migrací Bělorusy velmi chudka asimilovali se, prostě roztvarali se v nových krajinách. Zaraz je to mocné běloruské zhurtování v zaměře, samoorganizovaná supolnost. Bělorusky školy, kluby, různé organizace, desítky jakých povstaly za pošlení několik hodů v Polsce, Litvě, Latvii, Germánii, Čechii, Estonii a jiných krajinách, svědčí o našem naměru vyjít z podruského světa, obdovat svůj. 
Dříve, když se Bělorusové ocitli v emigraci, tak poměrně rychle docházelo k jejich asimilaci. Mizeli v uvozovkách v nových zemích. Teď to jsou silné běloruské spolky, asociace v zahraničí, mají aktivity, mají činnost, běloruské školy, kluby, různé organizace. Žádání odrozňovat se, být přináležným k běloruské nácii, vychovat děti v běloruském kontextu, zajímat se samoedukací, vyplňovat probělé, vrtat běloruskou kulturní spáčinu, patrňovat se očinníkům. Ty je procesy, které dají nám rozumění naší identičnosti. Это тот белорусский свет, свет книг, песен, концертов, лекций, спектаклей, встреч, которые мы будем и которые каждый день перемогает русский свет. Снага се отличит бит соучасти белорусского народа, выховавать дети в белорусском контексте, в белорусском пространстве, как си, си дополнивать мезеры, навратят белорусское культурное детство, подпоровать Další Bělorusy. To jsou procesy, které nám poskytují pochopení naší identity. Je to běloruský svět. Svět knih, písní, koncertů, přednášek, divadelních představení, setkání. A s těmito jevy každý den vlastně vítězíme nad tím ruským světem. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marina, thank you for having remembered the victims of the covert Lukashenko's dictatorship. The next speaker is the German writer Boris Schumatsky. Boris was born on 1965 in Moscow. He studied art history and political science. Since the early 90s, he has lived in Germany as a freelance author and journalist for German language newspapers. After the Russian annexation of Crimea in spring 2014, Shumatsky wrote about a war code that prevailed in Russia. So please, what is uh, the lecture of Boris is entitled The Language of Russian Violence. So um, I'm also going to mention this Russian world you talk about from the other angle because this Russian world is a lot of violence. So Russian violence is language. Before I read my piece, I want to clarify two important points. First, uh, what I mean when I call this violence Russian, and second, what, what or where my position as a speaker is. I would say that violence always had an adjective. So we can talk, for example, about the German violence of the Nazis, which was industrialized in the sense of classic industries of the first half of the previous century. And it was also insane in the sense of racial mania of the time. Russian violence is quite different. It uh, operates in its society, in the Russian society, more as a language uh, than as a production. Um, I just made a brief reference between German and Russian violence because uh, German experience of violence and the history of coming to terms with it, this German Aufarbeitung, which is my point of reference. Although I grew up in Russia, I have lived in Berlin for three decades, and my writing language is German. This is also the speaker position uh, I have taken to discuss Russian violence today. That means I'm going to mention Germany and uh, also criticize uh, German positions um, because uh, speaking about uh, language, communication and violence, um, it's important to have two points, the Russian violence and uh, the subject of it. Okay, um, what I'm going to read is sometimes uh, an essay, an analysis and often a short story. I start with a scene I imagined 
imagined <laughs> when I was a young man. <laughs> the code of violence. They surround me, five or six young men in field uniforms. I smell old sweat. I hear they're going to kick your kidneys until you piss blood. Then they drag me, or so I imagined, into the toilets of their barracks and push my head into the toilet bowl. About half an hour later, I would be what they call kicking the bucket on the wet tile floor with internal and external injuries I won't list here. By the time I was 17 years old and I did not think that I would survive the next year of my life. Today, Russian and Soviet men uh, in today, Russian and uh, formerly Soviet men are drafted into the army at the age of 18. One there, the new conscripts are systematically abused, and mamas boys like me are often beaten to death or driven to suicide. The abusers are other soldiers, usually only a few months older. Anyone growing up in Russia knows dozens of, dozens of names for violence. The one in the army barracks is called Didavshina. Hundreds of thousands of young men are abused there every year, often beaten, sometimes raped or beaten to death. During the first few months, they are called Duhi or Sinki. Ghost, ghosts or little sons. They are forced to wash the underpants of other soldiers by hand if they don't want to lick out the toilet bowl with their tongues. Any ghost who submits to this didovchina is later promoted to death grandfather and is now allowed to educate the new arrivals himself. In this way, an endless circle of violence is created that has shaped all of Russia's closed institutions for decades. The army, prisons, foster homes, mental hospitals, and many, many others. From there, this system, this circle of violence, penetrates more or less the whole society. It is not primarily a matter of physical strength, but the willingness to use violence. Putin understands only strength. This sentence has 469 hits on the internet today, yesterday, I checked it, and at least as often is Russia misunderstood. Strength is not the key. In the West, so Michel Foucault, who actually avoided the word West, it is power that determines everything. In Russia, only one thing really counts, violence. Putin understands it and speaks it, speaks it fluently because violence, violence is a language in which his country, Putin's country, is encoded. I don't know that. I had violent Russian as a subject since primary school. When I was in the third or fourth grade, I discovered a defect of myself. It wasn't that my father was Jewish, he didn't tell me that. It was my inability to punch another kid in the face. It was all right for me when it happened in a game, but in a real life situation, like outside the biology room with Sergei, I was paralyzed. We are waiting outside the door, biology is about to start, and suddenly Sergei gets really serious. He says something to me, and I recognize it as an opening sentence of violence. 
usually it's an insinuation. You stole my toy Indian, even though he traded it for, for a cowboy. Or Putin's accusation against NATO. You are encircling us. Both means as much as light tap on the shoulder. Sergei is waiting to see how I react. He this Sergei is actually a nice boy. In a school where we would have learned only Russian or biology and not the language of violence, we might have been friends. But here it is better to be a sloy, evil. In Russian, evil is often good. An evil watchdog is a good one. Our teachers even talked about healthy evilness in sports, for example. An evil person is strong and merciless, which is how, West, which is how many Western European peace activists see Vladimir Putin. For them, peace means stopping all resistance, not provoking the aggressor. Sergei grabs me by the collar and pulls me toward him. But I can feel that he is still hesitating. Unconsciously, he probably is still hoping for the right answer, that I slap his hand away or call him a pidoras and ask, so that we, two bad boys, can pick up our backpacks from the floor and run to the biology room together. But I say, I don't want to fight with you. And I simply leave Sergei, who wants to be evil, no choice. Anyone who talks to Putin like that is insulting him. Instead, instead of we don't want to become a war party, he hears, you are just as much a whipping boy as we are. For him, this is a provocation. Sergei slaps, no, touches me on the cheek, almost without force, because in the syntax of violent Russian, a punch in the face is supported to come at the end of sentence. I know I am about to be beaten. The Russian is beat has the finality of German verbracht, deported. Verbracht ins Gelände mit der untrüglichen Spur, as Paul Zellern wrote about murdered Jews. If Sergei beats me up now, I'll become someone everyone has to beat up. That's how Russian violence works. If you don't abuse someone who has already been abused, you become someone like him, someone everybody has to beat up. Sergei takes a swing, he's going to hit me, he's going to beat me up, and maybe he has already metaphorically beaten me up to become a beaten one forever. I feel anger, or at least I can taste it. I beat my cheek when Sergei touched it. Now I am evil too, and Sergei feels it. He feels my fists on his head, my knees in his stomach. He holds his forearms in front of his face, has to pull back again and again until he can't anymore. He bumps his back against something soft. Our biology teacher. As I adjust my glasses, she says, go home, and next time I want to see you here with your parents. The language of Russian violence. When I started writing about Russian violence after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I didn't know where it would lead me. Now I have arrived to the place where Russian violence in its current, current form originated, in the prison camp. The worst thing that can happen to you there is to be degraded, that is, raped. 
tedy znásilnit. It's not only in the camp that victims of sexual violence are called insulted, degraded cops. I found more than a dozen synonyms on Wikipedia. Anyone who even touches a degraded person becomes one himself. Even if you accidentally touch their dishes or just get too close to them, say in the corner of their barracks, you can become one of them. There is a toilet in this corner, and one of the worst Russian insults is your place is by the latrine. That's how Russian diplomats talk to today, and Putin became president by threatening to kill Chechen terrorists in the shit house. Please, no escalation, no nuclear death. Only downgraded people sound like that in violent Russian. They must be beaten into their place in the latrine by any means necessary, including nuclear weapons. That is the basic law of the prison camp. Two thieves are playing cards at night at camp barracks. One loses and wants to bet on a red wool sweater belonging to another prisoner who is completely starved. The latter refuses, is stabbed in the ribs with a handmade knife, his sweater is put into the game and lost. This is a scene from Varlam Shalamov's Tales from Kolyma from Stalin's Gulag. For Shalamov, the violence of the criminals who ruled there was even more sinister than the shots fired by the guards or the starvation torture. It seemed worse to me too, but my high school classmates used to tell stories about, about bandits in our camps who gambled with the least lives of other prisoners. If I lose, I stab three cocks. Not many boys thought it was funny, but the way they said it made it sound like they would do the same thing if they came to camp. Better to stab a cock than to be one yourself. Shalamov probably did the best job of writing down this violence. At the same time, he warned, no one should know or even have heard of camp. The camp means corruption for everyone, for camp commandants and prisoners, for guards and for readers of fiction. And on another occasion, he was even more explicit. There is much in the camp that a man should not know, that he should not see, and if he had seen it, it is better for him to die. This knowledge about the violence in the camps has everyone in Russia. A third of male population was in the camp on, or is there now. Even the, you know, the people who refused to speak violent Russian. My parents, my friends, there were many of them, and there still are. And they are also aware of the camp, like Shalamov. Shalamov died in a psychiatric ward, maybe because of his genetic disease, maybe because of, of this knowledge. Violence is colonial, colonial oppression. I start with a small flashback. In two weeks from now, Putin will give the order for a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And now he is giving a press conference and is not in a, in a good mood. His botoxed face only slightly moves as he addresses the last 
to lives of this Russian folk crime to Ukraine. My sweetheart lies in a coffin. I'll make a pass at her, I'll fuck her, whether you like or not. You have to bow down to me. The last of uh, lines, uh, the, the, the first one is uh, swears. It, it doesn't, it didn't say. Um, there is a milder version of this rhyme in which the woman is sleeping, but Putin demands that Ukraine therapy, obey him, endure his violence. In the grammar of Russian, of Russian violence, the subject, the perpetrator of violence, can never stand without an object, without a terpila, a sufferer. Whoever wants to talk about peace with Russia must not be deaf to this, to this language. There is only one way to deal with victims who tells Russia about their legitimate interests, say above. When Putin says, obey in the, in the video, his case come to life, his eyes narrow, one corner of his mouth lifts, Putin seems satisfied with the act of speaking itself. Since the time of Tsars, countries like Russia conquered uh, countries that Russia conquered were said to have been pacified. In the Soviet Union, this was called the struggle for peace. And we learned in peace classes how the Western peace movement helped our country fight for peace all over the world. Today, they help Putin. Every time the word, the word peace is mentioned, even in an internet comment. It is registered in Russian open plane offices and thrown back at us with increased force. Every post means another bullet in somebody's flesh. Every flyer with Picasso stuff means that more people have to hide in the basement of their houses because uniformed men moved into their apartment, come to them in the basement, beat them up, rape them, shoot them until everything obeys them. Russian violence is obsessed with sex or what it thinks sex is. Russia rapes people in Ukraine and it does it in other countries it invades and it does it in its own prisons, barracks, old homes and homes. Sex, sexual violence is an instrument of submission, violence and love. A man in Ukrainian camouflage uniform struggles on the great earth, roaring or groaning each time another uniformed man bends down to him with a knife. His hands are in disposable gloves, bright blue, torn at the right wrist. Idaras, the man with a knife, curses. I hear the engine idling, the unintelligible voices of the third man, the Russians are about to castrate an Ukrainian prisoner of war, and they are filming it on a cell phone. Unlike public executions in old Paris or Moscow, the Ukrainian soldier is not tortured for show. The Russians post the video online like someone hanging their exam certificate on the wall. Look, we belong to the Russian world. This is the self-description of the linguistic area where, Russian, where violent Russian is spoken. Its borders, says Putin, don't end anywhere. There is no Russia. There is only a Russian empire, said Sergei Vita, prime minister of the last Tsar, in 1911, and he should know. 
There is and has not been no Russia, no na nation state, only a web of colonial violence in which territories, countries, and people are trapped. Lately, I've been seeing more and more online comments with Cyrillic word Russia spelled with a small r. This is grammatically correct, because in Ukrainian and Russian, and Belarusian, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, we have to take a break now, go to have a coffee, please, and then we come back and we continue with Julia. So please, uh, prosím, pojďme teď na kávu, vrátíme se za chvilku, nedá se nic dělat, jo. Musíme jako na to říct, že je to Okay, small r. Um, grammatically correct, because in Russian and Ukrainian only proper names are capitalized. Other nouns are not. People in Ukraine are currently learning that Russia is not a country name. To them, it means empire, submission, tyranny. All words written in lowercase. As a teenager, I, I thought that Russia was a normal country, at least in the past, before Stalin and before Lenin. But no matter how far back I look today, I can't find another Russia. This other culture, loving Russia, is an illusion. Culture is connected with violence. Even love is a vehicle of Spisovatel Milan Kundera popsal, jak odešel z Prahy, bylo to třetí den sovětské okupace 1968, utekl s kvůli autem. Všude, všude asi jenom nic, v polích, v lesích, všude byly tábory ruských pěšáků. Na jednom místě zastavili moje auto. Tři vojáci ho začali když operace skončila, důstojník, který nařídil, se mě rusky zeptal. Jak čustujete? To znamená, jak se máte, jak se cítíte? Jeho otázka neměla být zlomyslná nebo ironická, naopak. Jedná se o velké nedorozumění. Musíte si uvědomit, že my vás, Čechy, máme rádi. Kundera byl znechucen, když pochopil. Jejich postoj se nezakládá na sadistické rozkoši rabiáta, ale na zcela jiném archetypu neopětované lásce. Vzpomněte si, jak Putin řekl Ukrajině, musíš se mi klanět. Jde o neopětovanou lásku, která v, růz, v jazyce ruských okupantů znamená podřízení se. Jeho. Na konce lidského roku jsem milující ruskou opět viděl na snímcích Mariupol. V prvních týdnech války Rusko bombardovalo městské divadlo, kde byly stovky lidí uvnitř. Pravděpodobně se jednalo o dva lasery naváděné kilo, 500 kg bomby. Později okupační síly zakryly ruiny obřími hlavami namalovanými na plátně. Tolstoj, Puškin, Gogol. Gogol byl Ukrajinec, který se naučil milovat Rusko a pak se vevel v lesteneckém a náboženském hrauši za Belhadem. Ruská kultura a láska dávají vzniknout takzvané ruské duše. A tato ruská duše je součástí ruské vojenské doktríny. V Rusku dokonce existuje celé ministerstvo propagující tuto duši. Jmenuje se Rosa Trudničesla. Ruská kolegia leta s mnoha ruskými domy v zahraničí. V Německu láska k ruské duši také zajišťuje to, aby Rusko smělo zabíjet tisíce Ukrajinců, než se bude moci vůbec začít bránit za pomocí nové německé zbraně. 
plays a role here, but Sú also this fog feeling that Russia can't get the better of the role. One hears Vucic, he hears Mariupol, and thinks to himself, Dostoyevsky, 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 Chekhov, or they say it aloud. And they are right. Ruská duše je skutečně spojena s ruským násilím, s poddanstvím, s expanzí, protože ruské hranice jsou všude. Když mi bylo 8 let, stal jsem u městěnku na vojenských komisariát v Mostevské Gagarinově čtvrti. Myslel jsem si, že je šance tak 50 na 50, že se brzy zakouzlo do prachu v kasárnách. Ne. O močených dlaždicích na jejich záchodě zachránila mě máma. Při známé známých získala telefonní číslo jednoho generála a přesvědčila ho, aby zavolal mé odvodní komise. Podle předpisů jsem totiž byl příliš krátko zraký na vojenskou službu, ale tehdy odváděli každého i neschopného. Pokud neznal nějakého svého generála. Každopádně já jsem to přežil. Děkuji. Děkuji. minutovou přestávku, poté budeme pokračovat. Our next speaker. Uh, Žuža, and then, sorry, Žuža Ukázala, co stojí za tím oficiálním, oficiálním obrazem ukazovaným v Tématem Žuži jsou tabuizovaná témata druhé světové války v sovětské kultuře. Děkuji a děkuji za pozvání na takovou barvitou konferenci. Přívez jsem se účastnila pouze literárních konferencí a toto je pro mě v podstatě něco nového, protože od roku 2022 se účastním i tady těch političtí zaměřených historických. Chtěla bych mluvit o Nabokovi, ale zde není situace, abych mluvil o Nabokovi, takže samozřejmě on je důležitý žitý nejen jako autor, ale jako vynálezce slova komunacizm. Komunace. Tedy komunicistická věnuji svůj příspěvek těm, kteří i nadále pracují na památníku. Můj příspěvek má dvě části. První z nich je takové obecné nastínění tématu a v té druhé části se zabývám těmi konkrétními tabuizovanými tématy. Když jsem byla já na univerzitě, ruská literatura trvala zhruba do roku 1930, možná do roku 2004 maximálně. Nikdo nebyl ochoten velkou literaturu vyučovat až na některé nadšené sovětské manželky. Ale stejně jsme se zdráhali ruskou literaturu číst. Byla to proti reakce. Vyrůstali jsme na četbě nejvně herojické sovětské literatury, válečné literatury a dívali jsme se na filmy o druhé světové války. Celý v podstatě na válečných románech a filmech vyrostli v 50. a 60. letech generace Sovětu a tzv. východního roku. Sovětské děti si místo na policajta Lupiče hráli na frice a slovo německý se stalo synonymem pro nacistický. Ještě v roce 1990, kdy vyšly první maďarské postsovětské dějiny ruské literatury, existovala tato hranice roku 1940 a představila tu pevnou hranici v době. 
commission to me, including one hundred authors, was the most small, be versed in the evaluation of writers. What is a top book? A taboo is something we know should be kept silent about. But most of the Soviet taboos people did not even know about. And this book had not even been read. It was quiet. This is one of the main characteristics of terror. You cannot know for what. You will be punished and what to fear. In the authorized Russian literature on the Second World War, taboos are marked by empty space. They are zero phenomena. Look at what is not in this or that text. It's not a very productive approach. So we look for those authors who wrote the taboos. To do this, however, we must bridge a gap in time to read as the reader of that time. Imagine a war novel that not only begins with a retreat, but more than half of it is about a chaotic retreat of several months from passing to the water. But the military leadership makes mistakes. Ordinary people are not heroes, and even when they perform heroic deeds, seizing the strategic right in Stalingrad, it is with disproportionate loss, and despite misguided superiority, and with irrational lack. Lack. In this novel, Stalin's radio speech is replaced by an atmospheric disturbance. And in the news reviews, we hear the allied successes on the Western Front on 7th of November, and not a word about the anniversary of the revolution. The reader of that time, attaching special importance to all these nuances, could see the book as boldly going against the official propaganda. Today's reader might not even notice all this. I'm talking about the novel of Victor Nekrasov. From Kiev, published in 1946 under the title Stalingrad, although its original title was at the end of the world and later in the trenches of Stalingrad, in English, it had even more neutral title from my Stalingrad, not to mention the Hungarian version without any Stalingrad in it. In the early 50s, Nekrasov was asked to write a separate chapter on Stalin. While in 1962, he was asked to delete Stalin's name. He didn't really know the person who needed the second time, but it was kindly done for him. I wonder what they would ask him today to add or delete. The key question is, however, for what reason did Soviet culture keep writing about the war. Systematization was a continuous Soviet practice, a compulsory feature from the Civil War of 1921. Vasily Grossman, in Bergitschel, his debut story in 1934, had still the center of the plot of the Civil War, 14 years later. I will, return, I will return to Grossman later. But now I only mention that his name was not allowed to appear under his own words quoted on the monument of Hero Mother on Mamaev Kurgan or Height 102.0. The church in the background was built in 2005. So please read the quotation. In the 1930s, history played an important role in legitimizing Stalin's personal power. The events of 1970 revolution took a secondary position in relation to the history of the civil war. The Bolsheviks and the special Stalin believed that the civil war didn't end in the early 1920s because representatives of hostile classes continued to exist in the Soviet past and the struggle against them continued. 
In the 1930s, the leading role of the treatment of the revolutionary war was played by the Commission of the History of the Civil War, created with the personal participation of Stalin. In Stalin's view, Tsarist Russia represented an endless succession of victories, where a rigid style of leadership was justified by the ultimate goal. Propaganda quickly resulted from leading the eyes of the Tsarist Empire engaged with the military expansion of its territories. New heroes were autocratic emperors and conquering generals. In the film Suvorov, and Kutuzov, the suppression of Polish uprising by Suvorov morally justified the partition of Poland in September 1939 according to the Soviet Union. As a result of this partition, the territories of Western Belarus and Western Ukraine were included in the USSR. Which means that the Soviet army secured the same victories in the mid 20th century as the Tsarist army in the late 18th century. Apart from mythologizing and indoctrinating the regime destroyed in the past, the purpose of the compulsory war team was to maintain the royal state, as Stalin was preparing war from the beginning of his leadership, I repeat, from the very beginning. Events leading up to the Second World War, the Finnish war, the annexation of the Baltic states, or the movement of that, showed that the Soviet Union was preparing to act as an aggressor. No taboo topic could threaten the general principles of the solidity of the state about the superiority of socialism, the enormous strength of the Soviet army, the outstanding role of the leaders, etc. The dehumanized, almost diabolical portrayal of the enemy made it part of the war propaganda. And it has been tradition in Tsarist Russia, by the way, against the Jews. The bellicose atmosphere of late Stalinism continued in the years after the Second World War. Soviet Russia, great patriotic war. Instead of a peaceful period of disarmament and reconstruction, the Cold War maintained the continuing actuality of war for official agenda. The series of taboo subjects on the war was based on three categories, anti-Westernism, the resulting state anti-Semitism, and the concealment of the real historic events of the Second World War, all three derived from the utilitarian logic of an expansive imperial. Expansive imperial ideology and politics. The Brezhnev era redefined the war card. By this time, nor the 1970 revolution, neither the civil war could be the subject of inspiring propaganda. The new ideological alignment point became the patriotic war. Brezhnev announced his thesis on the first symbolic speech in Prada on 9th of May 1965. Both he and his cadres were war veterans, and the new card was uh, counting on a mass base of war veterans, including the masses of invalids. I note that after the fall of the Soviet Union, nothing else could be salvaged from the Soviet past but the exploring of the Great Patriotic War, even by Yeltsin. So its mythologizing continued, and its reaction against Ukraine it became more and more important. Argued that the Soviet army, under the leadership of the Communist Party, ensured the victory of the Soviet Union in the war, proved the success of the communist regime, and the just cause justified the losses. This became the official Soviet Communist Party war. 
Und das ist der The Great Patriotic War became an untouchable sacred cow, and any violation of it was transported and punished. To understand the sacred status war of World War II, one must remember that it was based on the sacrifice and suffering of simple Soviet people of irrational scale. For example, only two percent of the male population born in the 1920s, meaning that during the war they were in the 20s, Also has a post-Soviet history. In 2009, a color version was made. 2009. The idea for the update was perhaps inspired by the election of Vladimir Putin as president, who, like the main Jewish Stiglitz, had worked as a Soviet intelligence officer in Germany. And here starts my sec the second part of my talk, which are good subjects in Soviet history concerning the Second World War and the reasons for this art as follows. Surprisingly or not, most of these topics are still all again valid today. First, it remains a secret that the Soviet Union agreed with the Germans on the partition of Poland. Officially, and later this course, Soviets liberated the Poles. In other words, it is forbidden, it is very important, it is forbidden to date the beginning of the war in 1939, including the occu uh, occupation of Finland, the Baltic States, Moldavia, etc., etc., etc. So, if you consider that, Takže, the alliance with Hitler's third side would be tak, uh, very clear. So, officially, the takže, uh, 41 invasion by German troops was the beginning of the war. Second, it remains a forbidden topic that the Soviet Union was called unprepared by the German invasion of 41, as was the fact that the weakening of the military leadership, the so-called decapitation of the army, and the internal purges were carried out before the war on the basis of fabricated This was the subject of Grigory Baklanov's novel, July 1941, uh, written in 1964, which was withdrawn after half the decades and republished only 15 years later. Three, 
No mention was allowed of the Russian liberation army led by General Vlasov, about which Georgi Vladimov emigrated in 1985. It was further surrender by the Vlasovs that the Germans were repulsed under Prague and the city escaped relatively escaped. You know more about that, I'm sure. Ale budete vědět určitě více o tom tady. Four. A big talk is that mass extermination of Jews, of Jews took place in the invaded territories by Nazi forces, aided by locally organized Soviet citizens, also volunteers. The failure to come to terms with this trauma made it possible today to, for Putin to project the past onto the present and blame Ukrainians as Nazis. For historical reasons, the second largest population of Jews on, uh, during, uh, in the time of the Second World War lived on the occupied territories on the west side, uh, which explains the high number of victims. Uh, unlike the Jewish victims in Europe, they were not sent to concentration camps, but were rapidly massacred on the spot. The reason for the taboo was that, according to Soviet ideology, mentioning too many victims, Jewish victims, would have both reduced the number of military casualties in proportion and would have emphasized multi ethnicity. Even in 2005, President Putin commemorated 27 million Soviet victims on the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz concentration camps. Although several camps were liberated by Soviet troops, there is still no Holocaust Memorial Day in Russia. In the name of and friendship of people as opposed to the long forgotten internationalists. The aim was to emphasize Russian dominance in This was a compelling reason for hiding facts of the Jewish genocide and later the Holocaust. Five, the heavy losses of the blockade of Leningrad were concealed part before the year of the uh, demoralizing effect of inhuman facts and laws, but mainly to cover up the military mistakes that were believed to be behind the prolongation of the blockade. The delay of supply, uh, the allowing of uh, unjustified losses was according to some contemporary analysts, deliberate, with the intention of weakening the over-defensive city. All this remains a taboo to this day, especially during the war aggression against Ukraine. Six, atrocities committed against civilians in the Eastern Bloc occupied the future so-called socialist countries during the war. Were done in the name of subsequent Likewise, silence covered the fact that some later socialist countries once fought the Germans alive against the Soviets, and the day soldiers killed Soviet civilians. I skip here the, how the punishing uh, the, uh, the aggression against civilians was totally stopped in 47. Tabu 7, the participation of and heroism of the non-Jewish, uh, I'm sorry, non-Russian nations of the Soviet Union in the war would have undermined the leading role of the Russian nation and its dominance. In this paradoxical logic, first, the emblematic term great patriotic war proposed the idea of the unity of the people are patri. Then this united people with the Russian dominance term the multi-ethnic Soviet state fully Russia, an era of new nationalist arrived. Over the 1941, uh, Stalin's rhetoric included the phrases our great ancestors, of all of us, Adam and Eve, or who? 
Adam a Eva, and the slogan is my brothers and sisters now preparing in Putin's speeches. In his 1945 talk, Stalin said that he was drinking above all to the health of the Russian people because they are the most outstanding communities that made the Soviet Union. And it was sacrificed by canonized artistic literature, etc. And even science. A the taboo world activity was smashed. Uh, Group that spies, practically the elite uh, uh, And the exposure of interpreters and dissidents always served to intimidate with violence repercussions. Vladimir Bogomol 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 tried to uh, write on that in 1973. Uh, 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 interesting point that the 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 of the smash. Tabu number nine. It, it was an instructive forbidden to draw parallels between the Nazi concentration camps and the Soviet military system. To prevent the parallels being extended to similarities between the two regimes and the Soviet regime. Veselý Grossman to však udělal a já bych si považila, kdyby to tomu mohla dát. Nebylo zveřejněno, že Einstein pro německé střemové bombardéry a úplně náhozeva a použitá k invazi do Polské Francie, Belgie, Jezezemska, Norska, Jugoslávie, Rumunska, Sámová, tedy Sovětský svaz a Rumunska. Najdeme to v jmenu Artura Köstel, takže vzpomeňme na to, co se to bylo v dnešní době. Je zmínka o tom, of war returning from German captivity were taken to Gulag, suspected of espionage. The Soviet regime turned against its own heroes, Therefore, Mihail Sholokov's touching story in his Nobel Prize winning novel, Fate of a Man, is based on a pure lie. No mention at the same time that only 50% half of the German prisoners of war survived uh, in, in, uh, Soviet, in the Soviet Union, as the Soviet state didn't ratify the 1928 Geneva Convention concerning the prisoners of war. Any mention of the opening of Western Front Line and its role in victory under Stalingrad was considered a betrayal because it tarnished the image of the Soviet Union as the solely victorious force, the only defeat that was Nazi in the world. And finally, 13, I read as an introduction, Quotation from Vasily Grossman's great novel, Life and Fate, of course forbidden, was published in uh, uh, Switzerland in 1980. But this uh, quotation is pronounced under Stalingrad. Ten years after the Stalingrad victory, Stalin raised the sword of annihilation twisted up from Hitler's hand over the heads of the Jews saved by the Soviet army. The complex taboo number 13 is the case and fate of the fundraising Jewish anti-fascist committee along with the so-called cosmopolitan anti-Semitic campaign, the execution of Yiddish artists, 14 of them, and the history of band the Black Book. What led Stalin, who was considered the liberator of the remains of the European Jews in the early 40s, and also contributed to the establishment of the State of Israel in the late 40s, what led Stalin to start the campaign against Jews, to resuscitate the old slogans of bourgeois nationalists and the nationalist Jewish plot? 
In the second half of the war, German propaganda led to the rise of antisemitism among the exhausted soldiers who had been fighting for years, as well as among the military and state leadership. Also. This was a, an accompanying process alongside the rise of the Russian and non Soviet nationalism, fueled by the rhetoric of war. This is why Vasily Grossman and Ilya Erenburg began to combine the Black Book at the end of the 1943. The first part of the Black Book describes in detail the mass extermination of the Jewish population on the uh, occupied territories after the German invasion based on their accounts of survival. The second part describes the heroism of soldiers of Jewish origin fighting in the Red Army. But after the war, it was suddenly taboo to mention the large number of Jews among the victims. I, I spoke on that. On the memorials, the word Jewish victims of fascism was removed from the inscription and replaced by the equivalent Soviet, so Soviet victims of fascism. The Holocaust, the Babi Yar, you know more, maybe more about that. The 2,000 Ukrainian policemen who worked there and the word Jew itself became taboo subject. A collective amnesia covered the Soviet citizens, politicized policemen collaborating with the Germans were a sort of Soviet Nazis. The heroism of Jews on the battlefields were rarely mentioned. They were said to be cowards who stayed away from the fighting. And this is the way how Solzhenitsyn describes the Jewish figure of Cesar Markovic in one day of Ivan Denisovich. I'm not sure I didn't notice it when I first read this novel. And that now I see very clearly the hierarchy of the nationalities in, in one day of Ivan Denisovic. The Russian is at the top, other Slavic heroes are more or less acceptable, and the rest is silence. <laughs> in certain professions and institutions of higher education, Jewish numerous clauses was introduced as early in 1944. The style of cultural policy, which was extended to all the arts, was a continuation of this nationalist discourse during the war, and it main, uh, its main slogans became ruthless cosmopolitan, bowing to the West and traitor. From 1946, members of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee were also involved in the work or on Black Book. They had worked effectively for the Soviet Union during the war. The Soviets liked the idea of using the Jewish victims of the war as a means of raising funds from the world Jewish community, particularly in the United States. Negotiations were held around the world to obtain aid to continue the war and after Einstein, whom belongs, according to new research, whom belongs the idea to create the Black Book. So after, after Einstein, they met Thomas Mann, Isaac Weizmann, Charlie Chaplin, Mark Chagall, and Paul Hobson. After the war, their official visit to the US became a pretext for the accusation of being Zionist, which plans to organize a nationalistic Jewish party, and they were accused of being spies for the West. As today again, Western connections were meant as part of the Jewish cosmopolitan world. Grossman and Ehrenburg persisted in their work with the conviction that they would report on five billion people exterminated, Jews, in the Black Book. Uh, there is a long story of the publishing I will skip because I, I, I feel that the time is, but I, I am finishing. In the campaign, euphemistically dubbed as anti-cosmopolitanism, a hostile signal to the establishment of the initially welcome state of Israel at the time, the members of the Jewish Antifascist Committee began to be arrested in early 49 but the case was not publicly tried finally because the focus shifted to the statement published on the 13th of January 49, preparing the trial of the Bolshevik Jewish so-called doctor's plot. 
The Jewish artist arrested in 48-49 was secretly executed on 20th August 1952. It was the night of the murder of poets. poets. They exiled families were only informed in November 1955 when they were rehabilitated. The interrogation transcripts came to light 40 years later when the aged children could read, if they were able, the nonsense confessed by their tortured parents. But the xenophobic mood has not disappeared. The plaques were removed from Moscow houses in the spring of 2023, this year. Peretz Markish, the Yiddish poet number one, was executed also in 52. I was born in 1954. Peretz Markish never knew that I would be his daughter-in-law. His son became my husband. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zuzia. Please. Before Marco starts, I would like to invite you to a small party uh, that's part of our conference in the Vinohradsky Pivovar when it's finished. this place. So, Marco Martin is German writer and journalist focused on human rights in different parts of the world. Uh, and in May uh, 2022, he was one of the first signatories of an open letter to the Prime Minister Scholz, in which he was frequently asked to support the Ukraine military. So, Marco's uh, Intervention is entitled Alice Rila Gerstl, Friedrich Thorberg, How 20th Century Jewish German Writers Describe Prague as a Field in the Fight Against the Battle. Alice Rila Gerstl, Friedrich Thorberg, and Jimmy Jerevsky, Mexican Missionary Spisovatel, Batsato Stoletti, Popisovali, Prague, First of all, uh, thank you to Shusha Hetanyi for this eye opening. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I remember when uh, I was a kid in East Germany, we had to read uh, Sholokhov, and uh, we misunderstood it. We thought, okay, it's far from being this heroic Soviet narrative, but as we know now, it was based on a lie anyway. And when you mentioned uh, Viktor Nekrasov, uh, quite funny during the lunch break. I went to this wonderful uh, second bookstore on the other side of the bridge, and then I saw uh, the German edition of uh, Viktor Nekrasov's book uh, on both sides of the wall, uh, written in uh, his French exile, when he described uh, all the changes he made to make, he had to make on the Stalin uh, novel. So, uh, thank you again. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you have the of the conference. It's a pleasure and an honor to speak here in Prague, despite the fact that I'm not a historian, even not a literary scientist. But as a writer, I'm also a reader. Some of my short stories take place here in this town. But when I dare to steal now 20 minutes of your lifetime in order to speak about three 20 years novels taking place here in Prague too, it's certainly not because of literary snobbery. As a writer, I believe that we have the privilege to stand on the shoulders of all the generations before us. And as a citizen, I'm convinced that some of the so-called old books can still enlighten some important aspects of the present time. Of course, not by providing solutions, but by destroying our naive illusion that challenges and dangers of today would be new or predictable. 
iluzi, která so je a nebezpečím Takže prosím, Světa, Poměrně rychle se zařadil do obkruhu německých píšecích autorů, z nich ten je všechno pro světový židé. Sprot, věrný přítel Franca, který objevil literární talent, který byl také pozoruhodným sportovcem. Když tým židovských vodních kolistů Hagebouka hrál mistrovství republiky, bylo to díky ním dvěma gólům, které vstřelil. In 1938, ale nikoli That's really sad because the story of the anti-fascist exil, exile, returning Martin Dart becomes, wit uh, becomes witness how Prague turns into a new captivity only three years after its liberation. Can be an eye opener toto dílo může otevřít oči i dnes. Novel was published three years before Chesav Miloš famous The Captive Mind. And of course, it's interesting to see the similarities in the description of minds, creating or losing illusions about the real character of communism. Because the left-wing Democrat Martin Duke, after February 48, again fleeing and finding temporary shelter in the house in the outskirts of Prague, is giving a diary full of precise reflections on imperfect democracy and perfect dictatorship, on the communist kidnapping of words and human ideas and so on. I think we are all quite familiar So for our focus and the subject of this conference, something else seems to be even more important. The protagonist of the novel discovers how fragile is democracy and how dangerous the situation is if its inner enemy is connected with a foreign force. While classic competition in domestic politics made a focus on tactical steps and more or less respect to the traditional rules, a totalitarian power has a strategy and not just a plan B or a plan C or a plan A. In the words of the protagonist, quoting, in a soccer game, it's forbidden to touch the ball with your hands. In a rugby game, it's allowed. Democracy must face the fact that it's playing with soccer game rules against the rugby team. Democracy has to stop to play. And democracy has to realize that before the game starts, 
So trying to be very Takže clear and transparent in your position and argumentation, it's not just a question of moral rhetoric, it's a way to survive. And the almost eternal question is, is who is struggling to improve democracy? And who is using these intentions as a pretext to destroy democracy? There will be never ever only one answer, while the two dangers are always real, to fall into illiberal paranoia or into pseudo-tolerant naivety. Martin Duff becomes witness how fast institutions, parties, media and public opinion can be infiltrated and manipulated if they are the right person on an important position. While traditional politicians and bureaucrats tend to make or tend to avoid decisions on the short term and being very often occupied with short-sighted career struggles, the others have really a plan. Underestimating these plans can be fatal, and even the daily life, the natural strength of a big and modern and heterogeneous town cannot longer be protected. For Martin Dub and his friends in his novel, Prague not only changed, but became hostile. Escaping from one place to another, walking near Moldau, crossing Charles Bridge, having a secret apartment near to the palace we are gathering today, or taking again, or taking the drum number 11. In spring 48, he makes the same experience like Teresa and Milan Kundera's unbearable life of being 30 years later. Prague becomes so ugly. At the end, the protagonist in Friedrich Borg as well can escape to Austria, where Prague and the Democratic Republic are falling under Soviet repression, of course, with the help of numerous domestic accomplices. So we can still read this old novel as a constant warning. And taking the fact that the Trump Inca 11 still exists and has its start in reality as an invitation to reflect the double face of historical continuity. <coughs> when on September 1956, Leo Lania's novel as a foreign minister was published in Boston, the public interest was low. But when one month later, Russian tanks invited, invaded Budapest, the American audience was suddenly interested to read this novel on life and death of Jan Masaryk, son of the founder of the Czech of Czechoslovakia and the last non-communist foreign minister before and after the coup in February 1948. At this time, in 1956, Masaryk's violent death on 10th March 1948 in Prague, then immediately described by the communist government and the official media in Sivsaro, was almost a in the West. So it took Russian tanks in Budapest to remind Western readers what happened in Prague eight years ago. It means it reminded them for a short while. When the foreign minister got published in West Germany in 1916, it was not successful at all. Russian tanks in Budapest, as well as Russian infiltration in Prague, were meanwhile nothing but a footnote in history, if at all. Well, we could say the continuity of Russian aggression corresponds to the continuity of forgetfulness in the West. So again, all the more important are some of the old books. Leo Lanya, born as Lazar Herman in 1860, 1896 in the Jewish family in and spent his first 12 years of his journalist and career, literary career in Vienna and Berlin. His romantic love with the Communist Party ended already in 1921. Until, until the end of his life, in November 1961, he remained an anti-totalitarian social democrat. During his exile years in the US, he was a strong supporter of President Roosevelt's New Deal. But at the same time, he had to observe among his left-wing liberal friends an awful naivety and ignorance concerning Soviet Russia. And so in March 1948, he didn't believe one minute that Jan Masaryk really committed suicide in his living and workplace in Paris, Germany, situated less than one kilometer from the place of our conference. 
In 1959, the Špatně zůstává špatný svět, i pod kamufláží v lidové demokracie. To, co se stalo v Praze, ukazuje budoucnost každé západní země, která se podává do kosmosku. Jaká tragédie, že postěji tolik německých sociálních demokratů na tuto lekci zapomněl, dokonce až do 24. února 2022. But the foreign minister is much more than a documentary novel. It's a portrait of an isolated liberal in totalitarian times. It's a panorama of places, of different figures of parties, many of them frozen in conservative conservatives, and pseudo-liberals, 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 So we could read the foreign minister at the psychologickou se ocitli a my jsme se ocitli, abychom se dostali do situace. Při setkání s českým ministrem zahraničí velvyslanec pohledá, že by jeho velvyslanec stálo za nezákonným zatýkáním demokratických odpůrců a zároveň tyto odpůrce odsuzuje jako fašisté, což zdůvazňuje tím, že ti to nepřátelé lidů zahraničí, když se minister zahraničí zmíní o tom, že ti to političtí vězni jsou bývalí protifašističní odpůrci a přeživší německých koncentračních táborů. Polský velisán se jen zasměje. Prohlašuje to za západní propagandu a vyjadřuje obavy o ministrovo fyzické a hlavně duševní zdraví a tak dále a tak dále. Zatímco každý dnem dají do rukou českých komunistů podporovaných Kremlem další a další důležité zprávy v policii, justici, dopravy a armádě. Zrovnalo se jejich vůdce jmenuje Karel Mouda, ale jeho skutečné historické jméno bylo Rudolf Zánský. Ten se koncem 30. let v Moskvě učil makiavelismu a poslušnosti a sloužil stále do mým pánům, dokud se sám nestal obětí systému. Spolu s dalšími byl v prosinci 1950 v Praze oběšen po té, co byl odsouzen v vykonstruovaném slánském procesu jako špion. Před rokem 48 čer používá stejnou manipulativní rétoriku jako ruský velislanec. Popírá fakta, obvinuje západní demokracii z dominantní agresivity a v té době se vysmívá i slabému liberalismu a prohlašuje, že začíná nová doba. Nezní to znepokojivě jako dnešní výroky, ať už oficiální skrému, nebo komentáře v sociálních sítích od extrémně levicových a po extrémně pravicové. Minister zahraničí a jeho několik zbývajících přátel dostali velmi bolestivou lekci, že představa Československa jako mostu mezi východem a západem nebyla jen iluzí, ale pozvánku pro sovětský svaz, aby tento most převzal za svou dopadní kontrolu. Zatímco někteří západní novináři, takzvaní kremelští experti, nadále jezdí do Prahy na každodenní výlet a bez jakýchkoliv skutečných záleží tvrdí, že mostu Moskva politický systém v Praze rozhodně nezničí. A proto by měl západ nyní provést deeskalaci. No, zdá se, že i tento druh ignorantů přetrvává dodnes. Ministr zahraničí to se jí nevzpomíná na rozhovor se svým otcem, filozofem a zakladatelem republiky. Nevyjádřil snad již v roce 1918 své hluboké pochybnosti o ideálu takzvané ruské duše. A tak slovy Leolania říkal Tomáš Garek Masaryk. Cita. 
všechno to východní hrské pohledání životem a radostí. Ruský nihilista nemiluje svobodu a smrt. A jak arogantní a neličtí jsou všichni tito revolucionáři, ať se hlásí k Leninovi nebo Dostojevskému, Bakuninovi nebo Tolstému. A tak je téměř toto aktem odporu, i když se bezmocný, když minister zahraničí říká šéfovi komunistické strany. strany. Citace. Na chvíli tu hru, hru vyhrajete, protože vy lidé jste schopni prostě všeho hát, zrazovat, každý. Dokážete lidi rozpětat, ale jen my jsme schopni se smát sami. Citátu. Den poté je mrtvý, v roce 2004 je nařízeno nové soudní vyšetřování a zjistí se, že než na roce 2004 moské sovětské dokumenty o smrti na Masaryka zablokovaly a ruská vláda jakoukoliv českou žádost o nahlédnutí do spisů rázně odmítá. Co se, je, co se týče domácích kolaborantů, kde se vzal je každý a všechno má svou vlastní historii. Možná to zní banálně, ale všichni bychom si měli uvědomit, abychom se nedostávali do stejné pasti toho hloupého úžasu a jak k tomu došlo, to jsme nečekali. A tak mi na závěr mého vystoupení dovolte představit spisovatelku Alice Rühle Hugues. Telovo, která se narodila v 1894 v židovské rodině v Praze v Havlíčkově číslo 13. V roce 1894 se narodila v Praze jako mladá žena se přestěhovala do Drážde, kde se prodala za otorila známého levicového intelektuála a v roce 1921 ten se rozešel s ruským komunismem a pak se měme stolu zlenine, co zjistil, že kominterna není ani tak zružení mezinárodních komunistických stran, jako spíše převodovým pásem národně ruských pánů. V Tráštěnech Alice a Otto založili malé reklamatelství, psali a distribuovali knihy a brožury, Chtěli, aby lidi z těmnické křídy si seznámili s tématy jako práše, nenásilná výchova dětí a psychologi oba byli v kontaktu s Alfredem Adlerem. Protože v následku nacistů opustit Německu. Oto dostal práci na ministerstvu školství v Mexiku, kde proti němu stanil Stalin Štěn. Vzky je lojální komunista v Měrně Praze zahájili kampaň a Alice zůstala až do roku 1936 v rodné Praze. Ale už neměla český pas, takže nemohla oficiálně pracovat jako novinářka. Její blízká přítelkyně Milena Jesenská, rovněž skvělá novinářka, rozhodně mnohem více než jen tzv. bývalá přítelkyně France Kafka, jí pomáhala. Například vymýšlením pseudonymů, aby mohla Alice publikovat články. Poté se přestěhovala do Mexika a začala psát autobiograficky založený román Hanna a svoboda. Ale stejně jako Leo Lanias, ministr a ministr zahraničí kniha, je i Alice na knihu mnohem víc než jen klíčovým románem. Přítel hlavní knihy Hanna připomíná Milenu Jasenskou, zatímco Dalšímu zazpatřila spisovatele závěře kalendru, pozdějšího přeživšího německých koncentračních táborů a oběd stalinismu, který byl po politickém procesu v roce 1950 zavražděn ve vykonstruovaném procesu. Nová vypráví ještě více než jen při těch politické prchlice v mužském světě žurnalismu, v polovině 30. let v Praze. Viděno očima insidera a outsidera popisuje také počátek ruské infiltrace. Již v této době a dokonce i zde uvnitř demokratické a poměrně stabilní české demokracie, uvnitř českého světa novin, nakladatelství, kaváren, drbů a soukromých afér. Ale to jsou kromě aférky jen pro lidi na komunistickou stranu, protože členové strany se museli řídit oficiálními pokyny, které vydávali v Moskvě a také 
strany nesú druhé po kamen do tvojho koridoru stránsky. Napríklad po novembri s cítením zákonu o manželství v Sovjetském svazu sa monogamia stala jakousi revoluční povinností. A to i u nás v Praze, kde soudruzy a soudružky dostávali otázky ohledne svého soukromého života. Samozřejmě o spisy, samozřejmě o politických názorech či uchylky. A některé z těchto spisů byly za německá okupace po roce 1939 ukryty a pak použity pro stalinské čistky na počátku 50. let. A v roce 1937 odvážná žena jménem Alice Rühle Gerstelová Román na toto téma, v němž popisovala příčiny této přísně organizované kontroly lidí a myslí. Také Románová hrdinka Hanna se stává z jedné liberální nevědomosti a naivity. Její nekomunističtí kolegové novináři zcela ocení je potenciál nebezpečí. Místo toho se posmívají, smějí, nechápou komunistickou strategii jako více méně legrační kuriozitu. A konec i Hanu komunista posluzují jako nepřátelský život. Dokonce i stranické noviny Rudy Bravo, které do roku 1990 po hrybě stalinistický proudění rozjíždí kampaň. Poté, co stalinističtí soudruzy rozšířili fámu, že ona židovská antidacistická prchlice je špionkou testovat, hrozí jí smrtelné nebezpečí že její české úřady vyhostí zpět do Německa. Hana musí znovu utéct, protože ani Praha už pro ní není bezpečná. V Mexiku pak dvojice uprchlíků Alice a Otto dívá velmi neutěšené finanční situaci, znovu zažívají rozloucí vliv sil z Kremlu. Poté do demokratické španělské republiky v roce 1939 byl mexický prezident Cárdenas otevřel zdravice pro tisíce antifrankistů. Byly mezi nimi i čelní stalinisté a proti stalinistí spisovatel Julian Gorkin, ale Češi odpoživá celná fotografka Tina Mordoty zemřela na takzvaný náhlý infarkt a tak dále. Ale už předtím se Alice a Otto stali terčem sovětských údání. Otto byl členem slavné komise do Wyho, která odpořádala veřejný proti proces poblíž Mexico City, aby vyvrátila Stalinovo trzení, že Leon Trotsky byl fašistickým agentem. Karol Treska, jeden z otových kolegů v komisi, byl zabit Stalinisty v New Yorku v roce 1943, tři roky po zavraždění Trotskyho ruským agentem Ramonem Mercadem. Několik měsíců předtím byla Alice častým a vítaným hostem v Trockého vila, kde on žil se svou ženou Natašou Sedovou a chránili ho bodyguardi. Ale ceny zápisky znalazly žádná báseň pro Trockého, vydané až po několik desetilit po její smrti, však nejsou vůbec hagiografické. Ano, je ohromená. Kvůli trockému, obrovskému přehledu ohledně historie, kvůli jeho dokonalým způsobům, mluví francouzsky, německy, ale má pochybnosti. A pochybnosti nejsou ve slově komunismus, vítány. Ani v malém prostoru mexické vily, v českém azylu nejslavnějšího Stalinova nepřítele. Když Lev Davidovič pořádal Alici, aby nám se vypásil o této čtvrté internacionální, Alice odpovídá jako Bartleby v příbězích Hermana Milvila. Raději bych to nedělal. Ve 20. století nenajdeme tolik intelektuálů, kteří by projevovali stejnou odvahu před takzvanými vůdci. V červnu 1943 o to zemřel na infarkt a jen o několik hodin později Alice skočila z okna jejich bytu a stáchala sebevraždu. Cita. Samozřejmě jsme my, přátelé Ote a Alice, okamžitě pojali podezření na sovětskou nájemnou vraždu. Ale tentokrát jsme se mílili. Bylo to v prosinci 2003, kdy mi to ve svém bytě 
v Mexiko City vyprávěla spisovatelka Marina Frank ve Stylemová. V té době jí bylo 104 let, ale velmi dobře si pamatovala na všechny podrobnosti. Vzpomínala také na to, co jí před desítkami let vyprávěl její manžel Paul Westheim o záhadné smrti slavného antifašistického a protistalinského nakladatele Billy Hominson Bergera v roku 1940 ve Francii. Ale... Dobrá, to už je jiný příběh. A tak mi dovolte, abych skončil Mariánskými nemyslovy z roku 2003. Citát. Na Otově a Alicině pohřbu nás bylo málo, velmi málo. Osamělí, izolovaní, exiloví antifašisté a antistalinisté z Evropy. Sekulární židé a samozřejmě opět ti, kteří jsou zoufali. Nebe bylo bez mráčku. Zaprášené listy pán nás nechránili před nemilosrdným vedrem. Ale pak jsme začali zpívat. A samozřejmě můj mladý přítel. Samozřejmě to byla internacionál. Protože to byla naše písaní, protože boj za lidská práva ještě zdaleka není ztracený. No pasarán. Dámy a pánové, děkuji vám za vaše pozornosti. Thank you, Marco. Uh, please, uh, how much? Uh, with us during the day, but just a few words. How uh, much with us works at Vilnius University as an associated professor. Among his published works are titles as In the Captivity of the Matrix, Soviet Lithuanian Historiography, or The Forms of Identity of Soviet Lithuanian Historians, the Level of Metaphor. So, uh, the title of uh, Aurima's lecture is Nikita Michalkov's film 12 as a handbook of Putinism. Aurima's I want why should I heard that Vladimir Putin was crying at the cinema during the screening of this movie. I can't imagine I can't imagine anything as disgusting as Putin crying in the movie theater. I definitely wanna talk about this at the very end of my presentation, so be patient. <laughs> you will hear a lot of interesting stories about Putin's tears. Very promising. Well, uh, dear participant of the conference, my presentation will be divided into four parts. Each part of the presentation uh, is going to focus on one particular question. First question, why do we need to talk about Putinism again? Second question, why Nikita Mikhailov? Uh, third question, why do we need to take a close look into the film 12? And fourth question, how do the portraits of jurors in that film 12 express the main ideas of Putinism. So let's start from the first question. Why do we need to talk about Putinism again? So uh, it is obvious because we made a few crucial mistakes. Let's talk about first mistake. We assumed that Vladimir Putin was a pragmatist, a typical representative of so-called post-Soviet political elite, the man without a face, according to Russian and American journalist Marshall Gessen, whose main goal in his life was to accumulate power, money, and property. And it is obvious that it was uh, a false assumption. It seems that Putin had planned and implemented his actions having in mind uh, a strange and horrific worldview, which we can describe as an interpretation and vulgarization of an American political scientist Samuel Huntington's conception about the conflict of civilizations as the main feature of history. So, how Putin's doctrine was born and grew up and spread as Putinism? Uh, we don't have an opportunity to, to, to talk about such important parts of Putin's uh, doctrine, uh, which play the role of the intellectual background of Putinism as the post-imperial sentiment, restorative nostalgia for Soviet times, particular postulates of Soviet historiography, the set of ideas taken from Berdyaev, Solovyov, 
Ilgin text, uh, of course, about the cult of Czechism and strange appeals to preserve so-called conservative values. I'm going to say only a few words about the concept of the sovereign democracy. Uh, this term was coined by Vladislav Surkov, and this term captures the logic and the mechanism of the reproduction of power and the way democratic institutions are used and misused to preserve the monopoly of power. What is missing in Western attempts to make sense of Putin's Russia is an insight in the political imagination of current political elites in Moscow, stated Ivan Krasnov in 2006. According to this political scientist, while reading clumsy, mediocre, and intellectually not inspiring texts writing, uh, written by Surkov and other Russian public relations specialists or ideologists, we made the second uh, mistake. We did not understand that sovereign democracy is an ideologically and emotionally potent concept. So if you if we want to understand how the pale idea of the sovereign democracy became a powerful tool in the sphere of domestic and foreign policies that provide the Russian Federation, we should take a closer look into the sphere of contemporary Russian culture. I will try to uh, take a look into the one important sphere of such culture, Russian cinema. Uh, so, how cinema interpreted the topic of Russian society's uniqueness? Uh, why Nikita Mikhalkov? Sergei, uh, Sergei, Nikita Sergeyevich Mikhalkov uh, is a Russian filmmaker, actor, and head of the Russian Cinematographers Union. Nikita Mikhalkov's film, Utamlyonny Sertsem, but uh, by the sun, won an Oscar as the best foreign language film in 1995. Uh, this film director is without a doubt one of the best known Russian filmmakers. His films cover a range of historical periods and film genres. Uh, Halkov's career stretched from Khrushchev's tour uh, through the Brezhnev's years of stagnation to Gorbachev's perestroika and Soviet, uh, post Soviet period. The fact that Mikhalkov never had problems with censorship, at least none of his films was banned, was often attributed to his highly privileged Soviet family background. And I would like to say uh, a few words about that family. Uh, Mikhalkov is the uh, representative of the Russian elite family, whose uh, representatives carefully follow the main rule of so-called state patriotism. Person must remain loyal and to serve its state no matter what socio-political system, democracy, authoritarianism, or even totalitarianism such state implement. The end of the story. So, uh, no matter uh, what your parents or grandparents were, uh, monarchists, communists, or even KGB officers, there is only one relevant question. Did they sincerely serve uh, the political elite Help, helping to strengthen Russia and to fight Russia's internal and external enemies. A skilled manipulator, an active player in the public arena, and an artist who likes cast, uh, to cast himself in role of power, quickly understood that the epoch of Vladimir Putin opened for him immense opportunities. Uh, so, Nikita Mikhalkov in Putin found a new hero, role model, and a patron. Meanwhile, Putin in Mikhalkov found its loyal supporter, chronicle, and exalter. The harsh critics of Mikhalkov's activities in the 21st century evaluated his latest films as, uh, the start of the quotation, an adequate aesthetic expression of Vladimir Putin's epoch. Meanwhile, the supporters named uh, uh, meanwhile uh, the supporters of Vladimir Putin named Mikhalkov the Russian Wagner. 
And what does Mikhalkov say about himself? The film director states modestly that he knows the answers about the most essential questions of Russian existence. Uh, some of the answers about Russian existence Mikhalkov gave in his 10,000 uh, word political manifesto titled Right and True, which was published and presented to the Russian government in 2010. The main theme of the manifesto was that Russia needs a strong leader who will guide the country along its special path to become prosperous and powerful. What type of government and civil society does, uh, uh, or society does Mikhailov view as uh, an ideal for Russia to become a geopolitical and spiritual center of the world? Uh, Russia needs to follow its own unique blend of enlightened conservatism. So, what kind of Russia's special path does Nikita Mikhailov show in his film 12? Uh, why do we need to take a close look at this particular film? Uh, I'm gonna... Uh, say a few words about this film, but uh, first of all, I would like to mention that Mikhailov does not separate film from reality, filmmaking from politics, or myth from history. Such a formula was used during the filmmaking process of uh, Mikhailov's movie 12. So, uh, the starting point for Mikhailov's, uh, for Mikhailov was of course, you all know that film 12, I'm the man. Uh, 1957 American legal drama uh, film directed by well-known uh, film director Sidney Lumet. The film tells the story of a jury of white 12 men as they deliberate the conviction or acquittal of a Puerto Rican teenager charged with murder based on reasonable doubt. 12 angry men is regarded by many critics in the whole world as a one of the greatest films ever made or the most radical courtroom drama in cinema history and as a saga of epic proportions. According to American film critic Roger Ebert, a legendary uh, film critic Roger Ebert, 12 Angry Men remains a monument of American filmmaking. And more than 50 years after it, it was made, its story is still powerful enough to inspire a new version of the story which was told by Nikita Mikhailov. At first sight, Mikhailov did not invent a bicycle. The story is well known. A 12th man jury decides whether a young Chechen boy is guilty of the murder of his stepfather, a Russian military officer. So, the jury is sequestered in the sport hall of a school next to the courtroom. The men are tired and impatient to go home. It is assumed that the defendant, a young boy accused of murder, is guilty. A quick vote is called for. It seems that the result of this vote is predictable. But the balloting shows suddenly 11 fought convincing and one against. This generated this situation generated a long and dodgy debate, which camera carefully follows. So, on the one hand, Mikhailov used the same narrative scheme as Sydney Lumet, which is why the audience knew uh, before the entering uh, cinema what the story was about, how it would progress, and how it would end. On the other hand, Mikhailov has made a new film with its original characters and stories. One by one, member of the jury tells a story or a secret which we can evaluate as an important piece of the whole picture. This picture reveals a contemporary, a portrait of contemporary Russian society looking for a strong leader who probably will guide the country along its special path. So, uh, the film 12 repeats 
the same scheme uh, of the narrative which was invented, created by or adapted uh, by Sidney Lumet. Uh, Lumet did not uh, write uh, the scenario and at the same time proposed new important ideas. Uh, create uh, artistic version of the Putinism. So how do the portraits of jurors express the main ideas of Putinism? First of all, it is really important to know uh, to note that the casting of the film 12 was simply outstanding. Uh, Nikita Mikhalkov gathered an exclusive uh, group of actors, the cream of the cream. Uh, all of them are the real masters and the big stars in Russian cinema. Uh, so let's take a look at the concrete portraits of the jurors. Let's start from the first juror, an idealist, uh, actor Sergei Makovetsky, known as the people's actor of Russia, Makovetsky presents a shy, shy, timid character, a scientist, physicist who works in a big international company. The first juror had thought tough days in his life. He drank a lot, uh, he lost his family, but now his successful businessman has been a father. The first juror refused to condemn the young Chechen boy without careful consideration of all arguments, pros and con contra. Makovetsky plays the role of an idealist who creates miracles in the uncomfortable Russian socio-economic reality. Second juror, uh, former uh, uh, agent of Geru or Noble Knight, actor Nikita Mikhailov. Second juror is a former retired officer of the Foreign Military Intelligence uh, Agency of the General Staff of the Armed Force or, in other words, главное управление Генерального штаба вооруженных сил Российской Федерации. According to, to a former intelligence officer, he understood that the young Chechen boy was innocent from during the first few minutes of the trial process, but he intended to allow the other jurors to reach the same conclusion. Uh, Mikhailov's character is a strong and uh, wise man with high moral principles. Uh, principles. Such noble knights uh, are the cornerstone of the contemporary Russian society. By the way, uh, Mikhailov, uh, as I have already mentioned, has cast himself in the role of a charismatic political and moral leaders many times. Uh, so this is not new situation for him. Third juror, taxi driver, actor Sergei Garmash. The taxi driver is a Russian nationalist. This man believes that the start of the quotation, a smelly che Chechen bastard is guilty of murdering of, uh, of a Russian army officer. The end of the quotation. That is why the taxi driver wants uh, the start of the quotation to lock down this guy for the rest of his life and to go home to have beer. Uh, but despite rudeness and aggressive behavior, Garmash character deep in his heart is a sensitive and good person. He only needs to, that beneficial opportunity to show his benevolence. Let's move to the fourth juror, old Jew, old beard Jew, Valentin Gaft. This man has the start of the quotation. One Jewish feature, the ability to be thoughtful and to believe in impossible things. The end of the quotation. Such readiness to embrace the unknown was directly related to his life experience. According to, scenario, to the scenario, her juror survived the Holocaust in ghetto, in ghetto somewhere in Lithuania, in Komuna or Vilnius ghetto, probably. We don't know uh, exactly. But Gaft's character's father, the prisoner of the ghetto, fell in love with the Lithuanian officer's unit wife. This officer, according to the scenario, served in the, in the SS unit. This love was mutual but doomed. Uh, luckily, the Soviet army came to Lithuania. 
Can you imagine what would be the fate of the lovers if not the Soviet soldiers? Victory asks all Jew, other participants of the jury trial. So, in my opinion, uh, this character shows anthropologically the other uh, who is not completely integrated into the Russian society, but uh, it, uh, for him is allowed to exist somehow. Uh, in that uh, society. Let's move to the fifth. Juror pensioner, Alexei Petrenko. Alexei Petrenko plays the comic character, the old man who is completely lost in time and space. He's on the jury for the first time and can't simply imagine that the start of deportation, maybe we, insignificant people, could do something. Uh, by the way, this old pensioner is visually similar to the Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko and even say a few words uh, in Belarusian language uh, during the uh, whole film. Uh, the sixth juror, bad oligarch, Yuri Stoyan. A bad oligarch is a media tycoon. This alumnus of Harvard is not interested in the truth, of course. The main important thing for him is a shocking plot which cost a lot of money. He changed his attitude many times during the jury trial. Second, uh, juror surgeon, Sergei Gazal. The surgeon is an Arme Armenian who lives in Russia. He earns good money and does not care about the truth. That character played by Gazarov is a symbol of the order who is, a, who is already assimilated and incorporated into Russian society's life. Eighth juror, artist Mikhail Refrem, popular humorist with Jewish roots. He's afraid to be late for his tour. That is why Yefremov character wants to vote as quickly as possible. It does not matter how. I, uh, I had a uh, really interesting conversation with um, Ukrainian film director uh, Sergei Uznitsa about this particular role which was played by Mikhail Yefremov in um, this nasty uh, role in uh, this particular uh, Halkov film and according to Uznitsa uh, this role was personal revenge for Yefremov for Yefremov uh, from uh, Mikhalkov's side, but uh, I, don't, I don't know, is, is this true? So, uh, the artist is a morally bankrupt personality. Uh, the ninth, uh, ninth juror, good oligarch, Oleksii Horbunov, the owner of a private cemetery acquired crossover, uh, crossword solver. For the first time, he joins the discussion with the words, the start of the quotation. A Russian will never live according to the law because he is born. The law is dead because there is nothing human and personal in it. Meanwhile, a Russian without a personal relationship feels bad, neither to steal nor to see. Uh, the end of the quotation. So, the good oligarch and the uh, ninth juror earns money in so-called gray zone, but he's a kind-hearted person who shares his wealth with those who are in need. Uh, the tenth juror, the representative of democratic opposition, Sergei Artsibashev. The tenth juror does not care about the truth, of course. Uh, this is the man without any moral principles. He does not uh, have any responsibility. It is even difficult for him to flush the toilet. Uh, this dirty job must uh, be done by, you can guess, Mikhailov, of course. Uh, the representative uh, of the democratic opposition is one of the last to believe the version that the young Chechen boy is innocent. The 11th juror, a man from the FSB, uh, or actor Viktor Vesbitsky. Uh, a man from FSB does, doesn't engage in off-topic conversations. He stays focused all the time and works hard uh, in the corner of the sport hall. A man from FSB initiated one of the most important turning points during the jury session when the votes are equally divided. Six votes against 
and six votes for. His analytical abilities help jurors understand that the crime is not as simple as it seemed from the very beginning. And this particular actor remains me someone, but uh, uh, I will leave uh, that uh, for the uh, conversation uh, next to Bob. Uh, the 12th, uh, juror and intellectual, Roman uh, Madian, a faceless and spineless, spineless intellectual, a stammering person without his own opinion, a dean of the faculty. At first, holds the conviction that a young man is guilty, then without any argumentation switches to the camp of those who hold the opposite opinion. So, the process driving force, the first and the second juror, and the uh, eleventh juror, the idealist and two men from Organi, uh, persuade the rest uh, that uh, the boy is innocent during loss, uh, uh, last uh, uh, long-lasting debates and uh, uh, going to the conclusions I would like to repeat uh, the most important question how do the portraits of jurors created by Mikhailov express the main ideas of Putinism the picture of Russia society in the film 12 seems to suggest that this society undergoing post-Soviet transformations can only be provided with the necessary internal balance by a specific group of people, idealists, good oligarchs, good Russian nas nationalists, uh, hard workers and Nobel Knights uh, from the special services such as FSB or Garou. Only joint efforts of that part of society could neutralize the destructive processes that were started by bad oligarchs, the representative of so-called Demshiza, morally rotten intellectuals, artists and other scum. Uh, and this uh, could be my last sentence uh, or conclusion uh, remark, but uh, probably the most important thing and the most terrifying thing that is that the film 12 is poisonous product which it was masterfully crafted. Uh, the jury of the Venice International Film Festival defined the movie as the start of the quotation a uh, confirmation of Mikhalkov's mastery in exploiting and revealing to us with great humanity and emotion the complexity of existence. Uh, the end of the quotation. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the uh, American film critic, uh, thanks God, uh, uh, not well known American film critic, but still, uh, Debbie Lynn Ellis stated that. Nikita Mikhalkov, uh, the start of the quotation, brings a pathos and death to this film that fills the soul and with each character being placed center stage allows the audience to see parts of themselves on the screen. Uh, the end of the quotation. Uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin could not agree more with such a, state and, uh, such a statement and uh, you already mentioned that after the screening of the film in his residence in Novo Ogorovo, Putin remarked that the film brought key to the eye. So, it seems that we need to do a lot of work trying to understand how Russian culture helped to prepare contemporary Russia Russian society for the rise of totalitarianism and for the war again, uh, uh, against Ukraine and against the whole European civilization. Thank you for your attention. Heinrich is German Slavic scholar. Thank you. This photo uh, shows a poem. A poem by uh, Nobel laureate Iosif Brodsky, 
The photo itself is from August of this year. There are flowers all around. There are flowers and poems on the fresh grave of Evgeny Prigozhin, head of the Wagner group. Okay. The appearance of poems by Nobel laureate Bronsky on the grave of one of the main Russian war criminals who was responsible for the death of thousands of Ukrainian civilians, all people, women and children whom he ordered to kill, and tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers who died in the fight against the Wagner during the defense of Bakhmut and other fronts. So the appearance of Brodsky's poems on Prigozhin's grave is not an accident. And not only because Prigozhin and Brodsky are from Leningrad and Putin too. Not only. It's him, Brodsky, who wrote in uh, 1974, already abroad, an imperial, an imperial poem for Marshal Zhukov, a patriotic text which is now being reposted by Russian military channels. It was Brodsky who was reproached in the 80s by Chesov Miłosz for the fact that it's him, Brodsky, who, like no one else, positively aesthetized the word empire. And because we are in Prague, it's not for me to remind you that it was Brodsky who called Milan Kundera Czech cattle, Czech bydle, for Kundera's concept of Central Europe, containing a decolonizing critique of Russian imperialism and Russian literature as its bearer. And finally, it was Brodsky who wrote the chauvinist and revisionist poem on the independence of Ukraine in 1992. There is no need to be surprised by all this. Brodsky is not the exception, but a rule, a logical continuation, if not the culmination of a long-standing paradigm, a paradigm of a Russian poetic, politic, poetic, political uh, techniques and me, we are enemies. Uh, a paradigm of Ru Russian poetic political behavior in which pseudo oppositionality is harmoniously combined with imperiality. And in my paper today, I would like to briefly show that Russian literature and the empire are in a beneficial conspiracy and from the very beginning of both. The emergence and the initial development of Russian secular poetry, which began in the 17th, 17th century, intensifies after Peter's uh, self-proclamation of uh, Peter the Great, uh, the Great, uh, Proclamation of Russia as an empire in uh, 1721. In the next 300 years, from Elizabethan and Ca Catherine's projects to the peak of, of expansionary politics in the 19th century, through the crisis and recording of the imperial program of Tsarist Russia in the USSR, up to the explicitly neo-imperial agenda of Putin's Russia, imperial discourses will be reproduced, trans and de-reformed, but the very category of imperiality as the dominant feature of Russia remains a constant component of Russian literature in general and poetry in particular. As the philosopher Rosanov said, Russian literature of the 18th century, satires, odes, everything and everybody is help for the government, including in the in the creation of countries' imperial and identity. Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, Great Russia, Great Literature. Uh, Valeria Karablova was spoken yesterday about this greatness. The rhetoric of empire works with f figures and of expansion and greatness, but also with uh, over-increase of, uh, sig of uh, their significance on the verge of hyperbole. 
in which, by definition, lies the danger of the comic and the grotesque. At the first stage of the development of Russian literature imperial discourse, patriotic pathos and the poetic philosophy of the imperial sublime should have warned against this danger. In this regard, owed on the taking of uh, Khatin uh, by Mikhail Lomonosov becomes a paradigm forming, owed to the capture during the Russian-Turkish war of the Khotin, Khotin fortress on the territory of uh, today's Ukraine. This old was and is and is presented in Russian and Soviet schools as the beginning of a new Russian literature. In it, the allegorical geohistorical horizontal of the expanding expire is glorified in it from the height of odic delight, the rise of which is paralleled with the vertical of political power. Such glorifying inspiration is intended to combine elements of secular and sacred, rhetorical and poetic. These requests are best met by the highest style. Conceptually, it refers to the classicistic poetology of Pindaric rapture. Concretely, lexically, it uh, relies on the homegrown uh, tradition of church writing and translated psalmodic panegyric, which leads to additional hieratic implications. And at the verse level, it tries on the hypnotizing structure of the German syllabatonic verse, glorifying the sovereign state and, uh, as the bearer and the guardian of cosmic harmony on earth, poetry also glorifies its own perfection. In the 18th century, ode was a ceremonial imperial genre. The subject, the subject of chanting could be both past and future victories and conquests, military plans and threats to enemies and neighbors, even, ever, ever, even very distant ones, China, Japan, India, as for example in Lomonosov's Ode to the Accession of, of Peter III to the throne or in his panegyric to Catherine II for the new year 1764. Russian uh, radical, uh, radical politis, uh, politician Vladimir Zhirinovsky said 1991 that Russians are called upon to wash their feet in the Indian Ocean. But the program for this conquest of India was already in Lomonosov. Other contemporaries of Lomonosov, Mikhail Hiraskov and Semyon Narishkin, in turn, specialize in oaths on the occasion of conclude peace treaties, decorating them with signal words of enlightenment humanism. Just as Russian oppositionists, uh, oppositionists today, hiding behind some kind of criticism of the regime, they enjoy the imperiality of Russia. Liberalism is the favorite decoration of the Russian opposition. Everything was laid down then in the 18th century. Lomonosov's rival, the poet Alexander Sumarokov, like almost all poets of the 18th century, glorifies Russia's new territory acquisitions. For example, the conquest of Moldova. And if, God forbid, the Russians get into Moldova, then their propaganda will get the corresponding ode of Sumarokov. And 1755, Sumarokov wrote the programmatically meta imperial Dityramb. Who compared to Russia west with south and east? The mountains, who uh, uh, are proud of gold treasures are flowing to us. The peoples cover the steppe, various fruits grow there. Where the animals lived, Russians live now. Where the birds didn't fly, the entire region is covered with cities. Where the snow never melts, science uh, flourishes 
here. The description of the highest purpose of the empire is at the same time a meta description and the realization of lexical syntactic, syntactic riches and civilizing functions of poetry itself. The euphoric, euphoric glorification of the empire implicitly prepares the reader for the ending of the road, which is crowned with the image of the spread not so much of the empire itself as of the language of its poets chosen to proclaim uh, the imperial Russian's secret. If in Lomonosov's and Sumarokov's texts a more or less speculative singer of the empire speaks, then in the odes of another important poet of the 18th century, Gavriil Dzerzhavin, who autobiographies Russian poetry, the implicit author is personalized. From now on, by direct or uh, hidden, serious or playful hints, he finds himself connected with the empirical author. Unlike the Elizabethan era, the task of the poet of Catherine's era is no longer only the literary inauguration of power, but also the poetization of new literary and everyday uh, relations between the poet and the sovereign ruler. To a great or lesser extent, Dzerzhavin will, will remain faithful to this ethos of poetic biography, biographical privacy in his poems describing the conquest of Polish lands and praising the suppression of Polish uprisings and in glorifying expansion on the southern borders as the civilizing mission of the enlightened empress and in summing up his own merits in a paradigmatic pamitnik monument associated with Sumarokov's Ditiram. Uh, I cituję. What of me will pass from white sea to black, where Neva, Volga, Don, and Ural rivers flow, and among the countless peoples all will know how I traveled from obscurity to fame, the first to venture in our Russian tongue to celebrate aloud Catherine's virtues, to speak with warm simplicity of God and with a smile utter truth to princes. In, the, in our scientific literature, we uh, often speak about, uh, in, the context of, in the context of imperiality, we speak about the narrator of empire, and the, uh, in general, and about the narrativity of the imperial. The history of Russian imperial literature also draws attention to something else. Despite all the epicness of imperiality, there is no particular need for a storyteller, a storyteller of uh, empire, but there is a demand for a singer of the empire, a poet in whose mouth the rhetoric of the imperial expanse is allegorically recorded into the rhetoric of imperial time, historical and transcendental eschatologic. In Dzerzhavin's monument, which refers to Horace, Horatius, the geopoetic panorama of the empire from the white waters to the black waters with its countless peoples turns out to be the time and place, the chronotope of the action and effic effic effectiveness of the poetic glory of a, and of, of a particular poet, Dzerzhavin. The empire requires the poetization of its geotemporality, and the poetry, thanks to the empire, expands the circle of its present and more, and more importantly, future potential and providential readers. Every ode to the capture of another fortress or country is directly or indirectly a note to expanding the space of the audience of Russian literature. This is the pact between poetry and the empire, the Russian poetry and the Russian empire, certified by Dzerzhavin's monument, and which 
30 years later would be renewed in the poem of the same name, monument, uh, monument uh, Pamitnik, by another poet of the empire, Alexander Push. I shall be noised abroad through all great Russia. Her innumerable tongues shall speak my name, the tongue of the Slav's proud grandson, the Finn, and now the wild Tungus and Kalmyk, the steppe's friend. Not only the translatio imperi, but also the translatio of the language and poetry of the empire represents a separate unspoken paragraph of the agreement between Russian poetry and the empire. Dirjavin's geopoetic pathos of uh, enumerating conquered seers and rivers gives way in Pushkin to the metalinguistic and at the same time openly colonial pathos of the civilizing Russification on, of conquered Asian peoples. And after this poem, which was taught and is being taught by heart in Soviet and Russian schools, there are, there will be people, good Russians, who will say that Russian literature is anti-imperial. Is the dismantling of Putin's, of Pushkin busts and monuments through the Ukraine, which we observed in uh, uh, 2022, there was and is even more significance than the participants in these ideological, iconoclastic actions seem to think. Not only the presence of monuments is deconstructed as indexual, iconic and symbolic carries of memory, memory, memories and reminders of who is here, who is the boss here, Russian culture. The seemingly innocent poetic genre of monument itself was indirectly deconstructed within the frame work of which Dzerzhavin and Pushkin in Ukraine, once again looking back at what they had done poetically and politically, certified the agreement between the empire and literature. And I could talk for a long time, years, I, about how Pushkin became a national poet, chanting in his softened poems the capture and pacification of Caucasus and Crimea. And now, and after that, having already become a national poet who was personally censored by Tsar Nicholas, he wrote poems about the capture of Warsaw, chanting its cruelty. And this is Pushkin. Which, with, with which Nobel laureate Yosef, Yosef Brodsky ends his poem on the independence of Ukraine, in which he cursed the free choice of Ukraine, denied Ukraine any cultural autonomy and any value for Ukraine language and literature. I cito. God rest ye merry Cossacks, Hetmans, and Gulag guards, but mark, if it's your turn to be direct to graveyards, you'll whisper and wish your deathbed mattress a passion, not Shevchenko's bullshit, but poetry lines from Pushkin. This poem, the whole poem, this distorting Ukraine words, unfolds in the metaphor of rape. This poem by Brodsky already contains Mariupol, Baradyanka, European. Are there exceptions in Russian culture and literature? Of course, Boris Nemtsov, or we are in Prague, Natalia Gerbanevska, or for example, Alexander, uh, very rare ex uh, exceptions. For example, Alexander Herzen, Gerzen, a critic and a decent person of whom there is a particular uh, shortage uh, in Russia. He called such poems in connection with the suppression of the uprising in uh, 1863 on the Polish, Lithuanian, Belarusian lands very caustically, like as a manifestation of patriotic syphilis, 
which according to the to he, he to his observation and conclusions covered all lawyers of Russian uh, socialism. It's it's a, a comic picture of uh, Josef Brodsky in, uh, from the 60s uh, from the Odessa Film Studio. Then they were filming a film about the Second World War in Germany. After the war, literature was reviewed for proto-fascism in it. But in Germany, the connection between literature and imperial colonialism was not as strong as in Russia. In the Russian Reich, literature is not just a mediator, but also its generator. Therefore, to the question where where the Russian literature and together with it Russian society even in the event of a complete victory of, for Ukraine, will be able to deconstruct these patterns and paradigms. I do not dare to say. Now it seems that the Russian imperial patriotic syphilis is incurable. Thank you. The last intervention on March 16, 2012, Dmitry Konovalov and Vladislav Kovalev Okay, yes. So, on March 16, 2012, Dmitry Konovalov and Vladislav Kovalev accused of the terrorist bombing in Minsk metro were shot. They were executed despite protest of the international community, the defendants' rejection of their prior testimonies, as well as indications of irregularities during the investigation. This death penalty brought to a conclusion the old stage and marked the next one of the repressive po uh, policy of the Belarusian state. Since the beginning of the, no uh, of the notice, the specific forms of civil protest were formed in Belarus. The protest actions moved from active forms, so the tent camp in 2006, the protest 2010, to more passive. The only form of protest behavior that left was mass gathering, gatherings in the streets without any slogans. The protesters expressed their position with wordless applause. Music, theater and especially literature which is the most difficult to control in the time of internet, became the discursive space of the protest. In my presentation, I would try not only to analyze how the Belarusian literature of the, uh, of the notice 2010s, so before 20, the revolution in 2020, the protest in 2020, became the generator of non-violent protest through the example of semantic field of execution but also to discuss the metonymity of Slavic anti-colonial plots and topics which Belarusian poetry of that time was an indicator of. One of the characteristic and at the same time distinctive manifestations of Belarusian gallows writing is Versh Prashibinitsu, poem about the gallows, of poetess Vera Burla, written in the late notice. <coughs> So I quote. Uh, I will quote in Belarusian, but you can you, you could see here uh, the uh, translation in English. У дворы на улице Калиновского для детей поставили шибеницу, якую списали с турмы, бо она состарела морально. И одразу прибегли дети, как гайдаться на ее и подтягиваться, как ползать по ее и караскаться и заниматься корыстной гимнастикой. А батьки были уже не рады, бо забыли дети про мультики, про уроки и про компьютеры, прилепились сердцем до шибеницы. 
Мамки, няньки грукают шибинами и кричат им худшей до хаты и хвалюются, что из их вырасти, боившиеся вымовить шибиники. Да сдается мне лепей шибиники, лепей, лепей, докладно шибиники, лепей шибиники, чем каты. So, the action takes place in the courtyard of the street, the specifically named Kalinowski. Kastus Kalinowski. Kastus Kalinowski, Polish Konstanty Kalinowski, was one of the leaders of January uprising of 18. Uh, 63 against Russian economic, political and cultural violence in the western provinces of the empire. After the defeat of the uprising and mass repressions, Kalinovsky was executed by hanging by General Muravyov, nicknamed Muravyov Hangman for his cruelty. According to a historic anecdote, after his appointment as a governor of Grodna province in 1831, the general, the general was asked, asked whether he was a relative of the hanged decembrist Sergei Muravyov Apostol. The general replied that he comes not from those Muravyovs who are hanged, but from those who hangs. Painting the execution, Kalinovsky, poet, writer and revolutionary, wrote the so-called Listy Spatshibinitsy, Letters from Under the Gallows. In his testament, Kalinovsky, this uh, Belarusian Pratapopovakum, criticized the manifestations of Russian Empire using caustic and stentorian language understandable to everyone. For the first time in Belarusian history, he formulated the imperative of struggle for cultural and political autonomy of the country. Since then, in the Belarusian cultural memory, the execution by hanging is associated with the death of a fighter for the national anti-imperial independence and the gallows became a symbol of the historical fate of the Belarusian people. Thus, the Kalinovsky's name, which is appeared in the first line of the poem, uh, yes, back to the poem, uh, presets the tone of the whole text and becomes the discursive key for understanding of the Burlak's text. In the Burlak's poem, the gallows is, I quote, so dismissed from prison because it was more, uh, uh, because it was morally obsolete. The expression to be morally obsolete is used as a term for technical equipment, for which is it impossible to find spare parts. To gain a better understanding of the poem, it is important to remember that the death penalty hasn't been abolished to the present day in Belarus, and the death sentences have been executed. In other words, dismissing of the gallows takes place not because the government doesn't need the tools of execution anymore, but because of technical irrelevance, moral obsolences, uh, obsolence of specific equipment. Gallows. Today in Belarus, death sentences are executed with shirt in the head. Burlak builds a chronotopic chain, playground, the square, uh, the square as a space of protest, a place of execution. Playground becomes the prototype of so named Plosha, October Square in Minsk where many young students came out to protest in the notice. Official media has tried to under, understate the importance of the protest, calling the protesters non-adults. So the media tried to diminish the protest uh, consciences to an age-specific, uh, albeit ugly but normal, biologically explainable um, adults. Uh, uh, adult, adult. Pepertization of the protest in the notice was one of the main propagandistic strategies for its banalization. Poem about the gallows was written in the genre of children horror stories. The protagonists of such kind of stories are ordinary children who encounter an object pest that is a medium of evil forces, the gallows in our case. 
The character, like in classic examples of the genre, receives a warning about the danger of the object pest, so uh, the parents are concerned. But in our case, the children are not afraid of the gallows and play with it. One of the uh, uh, therapeutic functions of such horror stories is the removal of the kids' um, unconscious phobias with the help of fiction fear. Poem about the gallows, it is a horror story for children and adults in Belarus. Pessimistic articulation of sacrificial passivity becomes a psycho-performative school of required courage and civic activity. In other words, uh, Verai and deconstruct this already classic hanging motif in a postmodern manner. Andrei Khodanovich, perhaps uh, the most influential reformer of modern Belarusian literature, uh, chooses a strategy of privatization of lyrical themes. According to Khodanovich, of, no, uh, of the noted, the literature of um, open defiance, defiance, the politics of heroism, is maybe ideologically and ethically justifiable, but poetically is a dead uh, is a dead law. Realization of this program was his book of poems with erotic themes called Listis Pat Kodri, so Letters from Under the Blanket, uh, 2004, with an um, uh, unambiguous allusion to Letters from Under the Gallows. In the poem Paslanya da Belaruskaga Postmodernista, so Message to Belarusian Postmodernist, Hadanovich concentrates on poetologic and existential, uh, existential problem the next one, uh, of Gallo's text. I quote, A reportage is that you are in a shire, with 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 a it is significant that Hadanovich uses letters from under the gallows as already ready idiomatic name for genre uh, of certain kind of protest literature. Because of subtle intertextual Hadanovich's games, the notorious postmodern death of the author gets a new meaning in a gallows anti-colonial context of Belarusian literature. Roland Bart Mitafa obtains its tragic realization. In his attempt to break loose from the paradigms of gallows, protest, heroic takes to a private writing, Hadanovich is not alone. Alger Bakharevich's novel Saroka na Shibinitsi, so the magpie on the gallows, 2009, is built as a game with a postmodern actresses with various uh, royal paintings. Um, how we were in the center of the story is the painting they make by on the gallows, the allusion to which programs the connotations of gallows text and uh, consequently changes the modes and uh, horizons of reception. In turn, Belarusian gallows discourse enriched itself by allusions to gallows texts in, of, of European literature. So the Burlak's poem, in which the mother um, habitues uh, his child, his ch her child to future execution on the gallows, follows the paradigm that was set by Adam Mickiewicz's poem Domatki Polki. I vote. Um, Zwyczon żonemu zapomni grobowe zostaną sucha drewna, drewna szubinicy, za całą sławę krótki płacz kobiecy i długie nocne rodaków rozmowy. For the intertextuality of this text speaks not only the similarity of subject uh, didactic situation, but also the Mitskevich status in Belarus, where he is perceived as a Belarusian old, old poet, a single Belarusian independence who wrote in Polish. Burlak's poem about the gallows gets, gets to the discursive subject field uh, mortgaged by Mitskevich. Even if it is not the in, uh, intentional intertextual hyperlink, it is direct hit on anti-imperial target that is 
characteristic for Belarusian literature. Mitskevich's text was written in 1830 during the situation of the identification crisis of Poland after Russian repressions in the 1820s. It marked a new stage of Polish ethical and aesthetic culture of resignation and resistance. By her reference to Mitskevich, Burlak makes parallel the situation in Belarus in the notice uh, and in Poland on the eve of the 1830 uprising. Poetic analysis uh, of resignation becomes a, perlocu uh, a perlocutionary propaganda, a description of uh, defeated passivity and desperate indifference, and it uh, becomes an um, intertextually motivated appeal to uh, civic activity. An important intertext of Gallo's writing is a uh, reportage Psana now practices, or reports written under the news by Julius Fuchik, another hanged slave. In reality, of course, he was executed uh, by a guillotine. The reference to the text and the literary situation, which is simulated by this title, are found repeatedly in the text of Belarusian authors, and often, as in Hadanovich's text, was in Fandanoj's text, Fushik's reports written under the news is coupled with letters from under the gallows. Here is another typical example. Uh, so I quote uh, from a poem of uh, Jens Bajina uh, uh, from under the gallows, even the letters uh, to the people were written, the news on the neck itself inspired the reporting. Moreover, the, uh, the others use both the cult from Russian Soviet translation of, Yulu, Yulu, uh, of, of Fuchik's book Reportage z Petlioi na Shi, and the cult from Polish translation Reportage z Pod Shubinice for the title of Fuchik's books, book. Polish subtext of Belarusian Gelo's text is difficult to overemphasize. The title Listy spod Shubinitsy, Zapiski spod Shubinitsy, was given first for Kalinowski's letters by the Polish researcher and publisher of Kalinowski's text, Agaton Giller. Gelo's uh, chronotope becomes intertextual place of anti colonial solidarity in the discourses of resistance in Belarus and Poland. Intertextualization of the Gelo's text uh, pursues several strategies. On the one hand, it falls into the paradigm of authoritative texts of world literature. On the other hand, the Belarusian text becomes a recognizable European currency without losing its national specificity. In particular, the literary translation becomes an important rhetorical space for the Belarusian literature of the execution to join the European tradition. So, Hadanovich includes three translations from the French in his The Best. Sorry for my French. So, uh, these uh, three poems, Ballade de Pendu, so Villon's epitaph ballad of hanged men, uh, Avion, Dance Macabre, Dance of Death by Baudelaire, and uh, Ball de Pendu, Ball of Hanged Men by Rimbaud. Two texts out of the three, by the decadent Rimbaud and by the proto-decadent François Villon already contain the gallows motif in their titles. Sentenced to the gallows, François Villon wrote Belle de Pindu in, in prison while waiting for execution. Through his translation, Hadanovich inserts Villon into the paradigm of Belarusian letters from under the gallows. The creation of Belarusian own or Hadanoy's own experience of decadence is realized late, uh, latently through bringing the gallows allusions of French poetry to the discourse of gallows. Appeal to the classics of gallows topics is supported by translation of Polish Rimbaud's followers. So it's not a coincidence that Balada Ovisetsa the Ballad of the Hanged by Krzysztof Baczynski also was translated into Belarusian. In translational intertextual ways, Belarusian gallows takes tries on a, a tenacious poetic mask of European catastrophism and thus modifies the ideological patterns of paramartyrological Soviet culture.
So, better hanged man than hanged man. Uh, the act of poet Dmitry Strozov becomes the performative implementation of this earth mantra that sounds at the end of the burlak poem. After the announcement of death sentences to the metro terrorists, I mentioned uh, this uh, Kanavalov and Kavalov in the beginning of my paper. The poet Dmitry Strozov wrote an open letter to Lukashenko and appealed to the president to either cancel the execution or to execute Strozov himself. Poet in his letter indirectly implements the internal ultimatum, which was metaphorically proclaimed in the Burlak's text. After the crackdown of the 2006 and 2010 protests, directness and simplicity of expression were essential. Politics invades poetic, social life, the mode of writing. More effective expression of solidarity in the struggle against the regime was the answer not with two intricate and multi-valued postmodern deconstructions, but with simple antithesis. The independent literature of the notice 2010s was not afraid of simplifications which were necessary under the dictate of ethical dichotomy. I described above the specific modus of Belarusian protest with his characteristic martyr humility, felt resistance and internal resignation that was embodied in the gallows text of Belarusian literature. In 2020, during the mass protest, Belarusian culture appeared a ghostly chance to break out of the vicious circle of this sacrificial passivity. However, one of the main hymns of Belarusian protests, even 2020, as in 2010, um, remained an endless, uh, uh, endlessly beautiful and defeatist Belarusian version of the song Muri of Jacek Kaczmarski in the translation of Khadanovich. The fate of the Belarusian revolution, which was drawn in the um, uh, unprecedented violence, as if, from very the, uh, as if from the very beginning was programmed by the text of this song. The desire to destroy the walls and prisons turned into new, endless repressions. And only today, during the war in Ukraine, we can observe a real act of the overcoming and breaking by Belarus its own gallows curse. It began, however, not in the discursive field, but on the battlefield. Battlefield. The Belarusian regiment, which today fights on the side of Ukraine, is named Kastus Kalinovsky, and in this name there is not a wisp of gallows or resignation, but a pure struggle za nasho i vasho volnost. Děkuji vám všem za účast, zvolíme vás ještě jednou do toho Vinohradského pohoru. Thank you very much for your attention. We invite you to the Vinohrad Bravery to join with us at the party. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah.